Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I decided to bring this video where I'm going to be showing to you guys how to build a recipe app with authentication using the Marn tech stack. At the end of the video, I'm also going to be showing to you guys how to deploy and host this application online. So stick around to see this entire video if you want to check out the code, all of the code will be in the description. I'm also going to demo it a little bit for you guys right now. But uh, this video is pretty long, but I hope it teaches you guys a lot about Mern. I've been wanting to bring a video like this for a while now. So I'm excited for you guys to see this. So keep in mind before we get into the video, if you guys could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it. It will help support the channel. And yeah, that's that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. So now let's get into the demo. Okay, everyone. So here is the demo of what we're going to be building. So it is a recipe application. And um, I want to start out by saying that um, don't mind the UI, it doesn't really matter. That's not the point of the video. The point of the video is always is a functionality. So obviously, I spent little to no time doing the CSS. In fact, I'm not even going to show me writing the CSS because it will just take too long. And it will take away the focus out of the, the, the actual important things. So if you still want to check out the CSS, everything will be in the description. But basically, this is what we're building, right? It's a recipe app. Um, there's a bunch of recipes which I already created, as you can see over here. Um, and what happens is, uh, if you want to enter in a website, you need to log in or register. So if I want to register, I'll come over here and I'll put something like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm just gonna create an account called Leo. Let's imagine the username was Leo123. The password was Leo12345, uh, something like that, right? I'll click register and it will say registration completed. Now I'll log in. I can come over here and put Leo123, then the password Leo12345. And I'll click login. And you'll see that uh, <laughs> I've logged in into my account. I know I've logged in because um, internally a lot of the like, stuff is saved onto storage into their cookies. But also because you can see, it now says the button log out over here, instead of the login and register uh, link. And if I were to close this, right, and I just open it again, it would still be logged in, it persists upon closing the tab or changing tabs or whatever. So what happens is now that we've, we've logged in, we can even create a recipe. So to create a recipe, I just come over here, I put the name of the recipe, let's imagine I want to create the recipe for steak and fries. Um, if you wanted to create something like that, I would just come over here and put steak and fries, then a description of it, a piece of steak with a side of fries. <laughs> It's a horrible description, but you get what I mean. Then we put the ingredients, right? I'm actually basing it off on this recipe over here I just found online. So if I were, I could just do this, copy all the ingredients and to add more ingredients because it could be multiple ingredients, right? You just click on this button and it will, the form will allow you to add as many ingredients as you want. So I'll just copy this and put it over there. Um, I'll just put the four, I don't care that much. It's just an example, but you can, you can get the point of what I'm doing, right? Uh, yeah, I'll just put this ones. And then for instructions, you can just uh, put the instructions, I'll actually copy this instructions over here. Um, and just paste them. Yeah, as you can see, then the URL for the image, right? So in this case, over here, we're not allowing to upload images, although you could do something like this. I just put the image URL because uh, I thought it would make it more simple. And it would work just as fine as if you were to upload. And then for cooking time, I have no idea how long this would take. It says one hour and 30 minutes. That's actually a lot of time for cooking a steak and fry. Uh, but I'll put 90 minutes over here, which is the equivalent. Then when you're finished, you'll click create recipe, it will say recipe created. And you'll see that now that recipe should appear over here. As you can see, it appears right. But you will also see that there's a page called saved recipes, we haven't saved any recipes yet. But if I were to, for example, save uh, the California row, you'll see now it says saved over here. And the California row is in our saved one. Uh, if I want to save the lasagna or banana bread too, I don't know. And let's try to save the steak and fries as well. 
all of those will now be present inside of the saved recipes. It's a very simple application, but to be honest, applications like this involve a lot of the stuff that are required for larger applications. So you'll see it is a quite a bit of code and we'll, this video will be pretty long. However, it will help you understand a lot of how MERN works and how to implement projects using this tech stack. And the best part is at the end, I'll show you guys how to deploy this application using Hostinger. Okay, everyone. So before we start coding, I'm going to start the process for setting up the deployment for our app. Uh, I'm just going to create an account on Hostinger. And um, at the end of the video, I'm going to show us deploying. So this part is actually pretty quick. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about Hostinger because it is the platform that is sponsoring this video. It is a really nice platform which allows you to deploy and host your applications on the internet. Um, I've used Hostinger so many times in the past. I've made videos where I used Hostinger in the past and they've always been extremely reliable for me. They have 24 hour support, which is really good. And I've mentioned this in the past because in the past I've deployed websites and had to deal with problems when I couldn't get support from while using other platforms. So it is really nice that they have 24 hour support because um, you can resolve your issues really quickly. And in a world where there's users using your website, it is important to maintain it up at all times. It is also very affordable. So like, um, we're gonna if you see over here, you only pay $2.99 a month for a lot of stuff. You get storage, you get support, you get a free domain and a free email. You also get unlimited free SSL certificates and also you get the ability to host your entire application inside of Hostinger. So it's really cheap and they have an amazing price quality ratio, which means you get a lot of quality out of this service um, for a very cheap price. So like, if you want to set up, all we're going to do is we're going to click on add to cart over here for the web hosting plan, then we're going to go to our cart. And over here, there's a lot of options, right? And you see all of the perks that you get um, on top of all of these things over here, you can pay different prices depending on how long you want to set up your your hosting, I would indeed recommend setting up the 48 month one because it is technically the same price as setting up a whole year um, with with Hostinger. However, if you choose the 24 month one, instead of the 48 month, after that, that year, you'll have to pay a different price an increase in price um, to renew it for another year. So if you're interested in maintaining this for a longer time, you can save up to $432 using this over here. So we're going to click on this. And then you have to create your account, I already have an account. So I won't be doing this. So just either put your email address over here, or connect with Facebook or Google then you can select your payment. Uh, there's they have so many different options, as you can see over here. Um, but the important part that I want to show you guys is that I actually have a coupon code. So Hostinger was really nice. And they provided us with a coupon code called Pedro Tech. you'll see that if I apply this, we now get a discount, uh, which is a pretty good discount. And it's that's on top of already the discount that you're getting from this plan, which is 78%. So this is incredible. And you just fill in your your information for payment, and um, you should pretty much be set. So this is kind of how you set up hosting, it's really simple to set up. Um, after you're done with it, you can log into your account, and you can go into the hosting or dashboard. So this is pretty much how the hosting or dashboard looks like um, you might not already have other domains or stuff like I have uh, already set up, it's probably empty. However, you should pretty much see this part over here, which says uh, for you to claim your free domain, because when you bought the hosting plan, it comes with a free domain. So you can set it up by going through this. And we're going to do all of this at the end of the video. But then we also have our uh, premium web hosting, which is pending setup. And this will also be done at the end of the video. So make sure you see your uh, dashboard looking like this. And yeah, that's that's pretty much how you start setting up hosting. Now let's get into coding our project. Okay, everyone. So let's start writing the code for this project. You can see all I have over here is my VS code open. And I actually haven't created a project yet. All I'm doing is I just created two folders inside of my project called client and server. So the reason why we do this is when we have a full stack app, you should be probably be dividing your project into different directories, one for the client and one for the server, there's various different ways to organize it this way. Um, how, however, I like to have both of them open like this, so I don't have to have different windows of VS code open at the same time. But you can do however, way you want to do it. But for me, I'll just create a folder, the separate folders like this, and I'll put the react tab into the client and the Node.js and express server into the server folder. So as you can see, I will navigate towards my client folder by doing CD client. And over here, I'll run yarn 
create react app and I put a dot. So if you're using NPM, obviously just run NPX create react app, but I'm using yarn. So it will start generating a create react app application inside of my client folder. Then I'll open up another terminal. I'll change my directory to the server and we'll run the following commands. We'll first run yarn init just like this. It will ask us a bunch of questions. We'll just press enter for all of them and it will say done. What this did is it just created a package.json, a very simple one as you can see. But this package.json will change because now we're going to add a couple packages. So what we want to add is we want to add first of all express, right? Then we probably want to add um, course, which is uh, I'll, you, I'll, I'll explain what each library does as we use them, but it's a really important library as well. Then we're going to add the bcrypt library for password cryptography, I believe, or yeah, for password hashing. Then we're going to add uh, the JSON web token library. And finally, we're going to add mongoose. Um, and I'm going to press enter. So those are the actual dependencies we're going to be using in our server. Uh, there's still one more dependency we need to install, but this one is a dev dependency. So in order to install a dev dependency using a yarn, I'll just say yarn add dash dash dev node one. This is the dev dependency we want to install. Now you've seen all the packages are inside of our package.json and also our front end has been created. We're not going to touch our front end for a bit. We want to start out with our back end and that's what I usually recommend because the back end kind of a lot of people think the back end is serving the front end, but I like to think it the other way, which is the, the front end is serving the back end. The data and the logic all exists in the back end. The front end is supposed to display or interact with that data. So um, we're going to be working with the back end first. So what we want to do is uh, we want to create a folder called the source folder. And inside of the source folder, I want to create an index.js. And this index.js is where our project will start. So initially, we have to set up uh, our express server inside of this file. So how I'm going to do this is I'm going to start by importing express from the express library. Now, if you're familiar with Node.js, you might know that when you want to import stuff, you might see a notation like this, like const express equals to require um, express something like this. And this is fine. This is actually the default behavior in Node.js if you want to import a file. Um, however, when you're working with the front end application, you actually use the newer JavaScript notation, which is the import uh, express from the express library. This is a notation. And this works in either way works. But the thing is, uh, if we want to use the more the newest notation, which is this one over here, we actually have to make a change into our package.json. It's a very simple change. All we do is over here or anywhere else that makes sense, you just put a type and you put module just like this module. And now um, it will allow us to use this notation, which is great because uh, I prefer this notation either way. So we want to import express from express, then we want to import a uh, course from the course library, then we want to import mongoose from the mongoose library. And what these libraries are is the following express will be will serve as a framework to create our API. So it is a big part of um, of the Mern stack because it is the express the E of Mern. Um, and we're going to be using it to serve our front end to create an API really simply with Node.js. Course is a library that allows you to set up the rules between the communication between your front end and your back end. If you don't use cores over here, um, you'll probably get an error when you try to make an API request from your React application to your um, your your own server, right? And Mongoose is actually an ORM um, for MongoDB, which is the database management system that we're going to be using inside of this project. Mongoose will allow us to write like queries and communications to um, our database in a really simple way. And it's one of the most famous MongoDB arms out there. So right over here, we'll just put const app and set it equal to express to generate a version of our API. Then we can apply some middlewares that are going to be really useful inside of our application. The first one is the express dot JSON middleware, which all it's going to do is whenever you get data from the front end from the from a, when you send data from the front end, it will convert it into JSON inside of every single request may we create. So it is important or else you won't be able to get data from your front end in a simple 
to understand way. So then we're going to say app.use and we're going to put course. This over here will solve you many issues when trying to make that API request from the front end. Um, this is basically all we're going to do with course inside of this whole project, but it is extremely important to have it over here. Then we're going to come over here and we're going to say app.listen. Um, with this, all this does is basically tells our, our API to start and we're going to choose a port. We have to choose a port for our API to run on. I'm going to put 3001 because 3000 will be used by our front end. And then we can put a callback function that will be called whenever the API is running. All I'm going to put over here is a message saying server started just like this, right? Now, if I want to run the server, I can just come over here and say node, then write the path to our index.js file and you'll see that it will say server started. However, uh, we installed something called node one because what happens is if I make any changes into this code, uh, I'll have to kill the terminal and run this again. But I don't want to do that. I want every time I make any changes and I save the file for it to restart the server to demonstrate those changes. So that's where node one comes into play. With node one, what I can do is I can come into our package.json over here and I can add a script um, and I'll close this. I can add a script tag over here and a script I can write is the start script. So what this does is whenever I run yarn start inside of our terminal, whatever I put over here will run as well. So what I want to run is node one source slash index .js, which means that when I run yarn start, you'll see that now node one will run and it will start our server. And the most important thing is if I make any changes into my server or even just save the file, you'll see that every time I save, it will restart server automatically due to changes, as you can see. So this is basically the setup for our server. Now we have to start setting up our MongoDB database. So in order to set up your database, you have to go to this link over here. Um, we're going to be using obviously MongoDB and they have a service called MongoDB Atlas, which is a cloud uh, provided database that you can um, use, right? You can create databases um, and deploy them to uh, their cloud service. And um, the way we do this is we sign into our accounts. I'm going to sign into mine. So as you can see, I just signed in into mine and it will bring me to this dashboard over here. So I already have databases, right? I already used my th this thing over here to create um, databases. So that's why it looks a little bit like this. There are some already here. Uh, but yours, if you, this is your first time, then maybe not. So what I want to do is I want to first of all, come over here. And I want to create a new project, right? I'll click on new project, then I'll give it a name. So it's taking a bit, it's my Wi Fi, however, um, it will load eventually, as you can see, it just loaded, it will ask us to create a project. So I'll put a name over here, I'll call it recipe app, just like this, then click next. It'll ask us to choose the project owner. I'm choosing me myself uh, as the project owner, but you can invite other people and they'll have the same kind of um, permissions as you have. So I'm going to click on create project because I'm not going to add anyone and it will start creating the project for us. So when it's done, you'll see this is what um, it's going to appear. It's going to say create a database. However, there is a thing that we should do first, which is this message that appears over here. It says the current IP address not added because and you will not be able to connect to databases from this address. What this means is um, initially you need to write a whitelist the, the IP addresses that are going to have access to making requests to the database. So um, if you're currently using your computer, you or your internet, wherever you are, you want to add your current IP address. So I'm just gonna click on this button, and it will automatically allow us to connect to this database, as you can see. So now what I want to do is I want to click on build a database and it will bring us to this part over here. There's many options that you can choose, but obviously for the purpose of this video, we're gonna choose the free option over here. Um, it is the worst out of the other options. However, it's still really good because especially for learning, as you can see over here, it says for learning, um, we're gonna choose this one over here. Then it's gonna ask us for a provider. So what, what does a provider mean? Well, our database will be stored in one of these three cloud providers, right? And depending on it, it will actually have a different price. Um, AWS for me is the best option, in my opinion, is the one I like the most. And you can choose where your database will be will exist, right? So I want to choose the closest to me, which is 
Oregon, but you choose whichever one you think will be best. You can see Oregon is the one that is one of the ones that they recommend um, because it is closer to me. Then you can put a name for your cluster. Um, again, it says over here that you cannot change your name for the cluster after it's created. I'm going to call it recipes like this. It's just a name for your database. Then I'm going to click on create. You'll see that it will have created our thing, but it's also going to ask us for a username and a password so we can authenticate our connection. So I'm going to actually change this over here. The username, I'm going to call it Pedro Tech and the password, I'm going to call it um, something else, but it has to be a strong password. I'm going to try my no, actually, I'll try something that makes more sense, but it's also random random. So I'm just going to call it Mern password. I'll even show you guys what I'm writing. Mern password at one, two, three. I'll save this because it is important for me to save it. And I'll keep it I don't know over here. And then I'm going to create the user. Hopefully it works. Uh, it seems to have worked. As you can see, we added this user as a user that has access to this database, then it's going to ask how we want to connect to it, I'm going to um, ignore it for a moment. But you can see it's asking us to either to put our IP addresses, right, but we already did this, it's already over here. So we don't have to worry about this. Now, finally, what we want to do is we want to finish and close. So I'm going to click on this. I'm going to click on go to databases, and we have set up our database. So recipes is over here, it is loading it, but we currently don't have any connection to it inside of our code. So how exactly are we going to connect to it through our code? Well, the way we do it is really simple, we use mongoose for this. So somewhere over here, after our middlewares are applied, but before our app is listened to, we're going to write mongoose.connect. So this will generate a connection towards our server. Now, the way we connect is we come over here, we click on connect, it will ask us it will give us a lot of options of how we want to connect. The first thing we want to click is connect to your application, we're going to click on this, it's going to ask us the version or whatever, but it's also going to give us this thing over here. This link is what we're going to put inside of our code right over here. And there's one thing we still have to do, which is we have to replace this password field over here for our actual password. Now I recommend using environment variables if you're going to deploy this to GitHub. But for simplicity reasons, I'm just going to write the password that I created in front of you guys, which is this one over here, I'm going to save it. Um, then I'm going to put over here, just like this. And um, this should work as expected. However, there's also something important before this question mark over here, we want to put the name of the database we want to specifically connect to. In our case, it is the recipes database. So we'll copy this. And we'll put it over here. Now I'm going to save this. Now we should have connected to our database. Um, we can check to see Oh, it says that um, it's broken. Let's see why actually, I think I know what the error is, I think the password we put, um, <laughs> yeah, I think the password we put can't have a, an at symbol like this. So I'm gonna actually try to change it. So the way we do this is we actually go to our database access over here, click on edit. And then for password, I'm going to edit the password and I need to enter a new password. I'm going to try the same password as before. Uh, but without the the at so something like this. But without this at symbol over here. Yeah, this password contains special characters, which will be URL encoded. So um, I should have seen that, but <laughs> it's fine. So I'm going to use this password instead. And I'm going to click update user, hopefully it works. And I think it did. So now I'll actually put this password over here. And if we save this, I hope it doesn't break. Yeah, as you can see, it's not breaking anymore, which means that was the issue with our code all along. So now it seems that we have access to our database. But um, we have no way to know this unless we actually start using it and making requests to our database. So that's exactly what we want to do right now. So the way we do this is by first creating what is known as a model inside of our code. So a model would be a description of how um, a table or um, collection in our database would look like. So inside of our source folder over here, we're going to create a folder called models. And here we're going to create all the different collections are also known, known as tables, we're going to have inside of the database. So technically, we're only going to have two, but we're going to create the first one right now. 
it's going to be the users collection. So we're going to have users inside of our project, right? So we have to tell MongoDB how this users collection will look like. So instead of our users folder over here, or this our users.js file over here, we're going to import mongoose from mongoose just like this. Then down over here, we're going to create a variable called user schema and set it equal to a new mongoose.schema. Now, a schema is just an object that is going to define the structure of our data. So what do we want to know from a user? Well, for now, we only want to know two things. We just want to know their username, which we can describe it as having a type of string, and it should be required. So required equal to true, and it should be unique. We don't want two people with the same username, right? So what we have over here is we're defining that we want our collection to have a username field, and it has to be a string it has to be required. So you won't be able to create a user without a username. And it also has to be unique. Then we want to create a password field. And for password, it should be almost the same, but we don't want it to be unique because people can have the same password. It's it shouldn't <laughs> it why wouldn't why wouldn't they be able to so this right here should be the definition of the user schema for now, keep that in mind, because we're actually going to change it later when we start dealing with recipes. So what we do now is we want to create this thing called the user model, which is going to be equal to a mongoose.model that is going to be generated based on that schema. So why do we have to create a model when we already have a schema? Well, because over here, we're basically setting the schema to be a, a, a collection, and we give it a name. So this is the name that is going to be uh, called inside of our database, it's going to be a table or a collection called users, whatever we put over here, I want to call it real users. So that's what I'm going to put over here. And this user model is also what we're going to be using to make calls to this specific collection. So I'm going to export this into our code, I'm going to save this. Now I want to see if this actually worked, right? I want to see if this appeared inside of our database system over here. So what I want to do is I want to actually connect my database to a program inside of my computer, which is going to demonstrate the data in a simpler way of com compared to using this website for our, from MongoDB Atlas um, right here, right? So it's actually better. There's programs that they provide uh, software that they provide to do stuff like this to see your database to maybe add data to do all of that without using their website. One specific is the MongoDB compass, I recommend downloading this and I'll maybe put a link in the description if you want to. It's going to facilitate a lot. It's kind of like MySQL workbench if you're using MySQL. I don't know if you guys used in the past, but it's kind of like that, but for MongoDB. So when you download this, um, you'll see it open over here and you can click on new connection and you can come over here uh, back to your database, uh, click on connect and you'll see that they already have a simple connection mechanism to MongoDB compass, all you do is you click on this, copy this link over here, paste it inside of the MongoDB compass connection thing, again, put in your password. So I'm going to put Mern. Um, I forgot what the password was, I'll go back over here. It's Mern password one, two, three. So I'll just put it over here. Uh, just right over here. And I'll click on connect. So now you can see we have um, we have access to the actual uh, MongoDB Atlas con uh, project that we've connected over here. And it only has two different databases. As you can see, it has an admin and a local, I want you to ignore both of them, because we're actually going to create a new database straight up from here. Now this database is going to be called whatever we put over here. So we put recipes over here, we'll just put the same over here. So we're going to call recipes. And we can add a collection as a default uh, thing, right? They allow us to add a collection. Now, the collection we basically already created, right? It's this thing over here. Uh, we already defined its structure and everything. But we haven't actually created it inside of our actual, uh, we created it in code, but it's not connected to our actual database. So what we do is we create it right now by copying this thing, putting it over here, and clicking on create database, you'll see that now it will say recipes and users. And um, now we have access to both of them. So that's pretty good. You'll see that now if I come over here to collections, what we just created should be here as well, right? It's fully connected between all three parties. And 
if we wanted to add data, you'll see that now it will have this structure as well. So let's start doing that so you guys can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So we created this folder called models for defining how our structure will look like our data will look like, but we're going to create a folder called routes so that we can separate our API endpoints into different routes. So we're going to have two routes actually in our project. The first one is the users route, which is going to encompass everything related to logging in and registering. So instead of our users route, what we want to do is we want to first of all, import express from express, right? then we want to import some other stuff, we want to import JWT from JSON web token, which we're going to be using inside of this file, then import big crypt uh, from big crypt, which are we're also going to be using in this file, then we need to set up this as a router. So to do that, we create a variable called router, and set it equal to express dot router, just like this. And then at the end of this file, we need to export this whole thing um, as a router, just like this, we're going to export an object, which is going to contain this router, and we're going to change its name to uh, user router, so that because we're going to have more than one routers, so we have to change its name to user router. And now what we do is in our index.js, we come here, we import this thing from uh, the file routes slash users. And because we're using uh, the import notation over here, it is important that you actually import the files using dot js at the end, right using the extension or else you'll get an error. Then instead of this import statement, we import user router. And we can come over here. And we just apply this router by saying app dot use, and we put in the route or the endpoint that we want to set this up with, I'm going to call it auth. And then we put in the user router. So what we did here is we're just separating our code, so that we can write endpoints with all the endpoints, which are going to be related to authentication will exist inside of this file over here. Um, and we're just applying this so that um, express knows uh, that is divided this way. So now whatever endpoints we create over here, they will automatically start with this uh, thing over here, the slash auth route. So what we can do now is start creating the two routes which are going to exist over here. The first one is a post request, which is going to be for registering. So we can put post slash register, just like this. And the second one is uh, another post request, but it's going to be for logging in. So login, just like this. Let's start off with the register one. So this will be an asynchronous function, we're going to put a, a callback function over here. And each callback functions in uh, express have a, at least this two variables over here, or arguments to this function, a request variable and a response variable. So the request variable is used for getting data from you, from whoever made the API request to this endpoint. And the response variable is used to send data to back to whoever made that API request. So over here, when we are running in the front end, when we want to register an account, right, we want to register a user, we're going to send in from the front end, two pieces of information. One of them is going to be uh, the username. And the other one is a password. So when we make this API request in the front end, we need to make sure that we send in the through the body of the request, a, an object containing the username and a password, right? But so we're kind of assuming that in the front end we'll do that. But this is how we define uh, endpoints in your API. Then what we want to do is we want to confirm that a user with this username exists. So we're going to do our first request to our MongoDB database. And I'll show you guys how this will work. So we're going to say const user equals to await and we call the user model that we created. So it automatically imported, as you can see over here. And don't forget to also put the JS because or else it won't work. And then over here in our user model, we're going to use this, you can see there's a bunch of functions we can call with this user model. So what we are doing here is we're calling, we're making requests to this collection over here. So the request we want to do is we want to find one user. So there's this function called find one, and you can pass over here, uh, some sort of field, uh, or specific um, search that you want to make. So I want to find a user where the username of that user is equal to the username variable that we got over here. Obviously, in JavaScript, when the value and the key are the same, 
you can shorten it to uh, just be one word. But this is kind of the logic that we are using over here. Also, whenever you are making any con like request to your database, it should be it will return a promise. So you can use your, you can either use the dot then dot catch notation, or you can use an async await notation like we're doing over here. So right now, actually, all I want to do is I just want to give back this user. So what we do is we say res for response dot JSON, meaning we're going to send back a JSON. Uh, and we're going to send back the user that we found. So obviously, this is not the whole API endpoint. This is not how it's going to look at the end. But I'm doing this right now. So we can test it out and see if our API is running smoothly if it's all working. Um, and if our connection to our database is actually um, true. But the thing is, we currently don't have any users inside of our database. So let's create um, a fake user right here. To do this, we can click on um, add data, as you can see over here, and we can click on insert document. What this will do is it will give us this thing over here, where it's kind of a JSON, and we can add fields to this. So um, I can come over here and add um, a field called username. And we can put its value. So I'm going to create the Pedro tech user. And I need to put obviously commas. And we're going to put the password for this user as well. Let's put Pedro as a password, I'm going to click insert and you'll see that now inside of our collection users, there's a user with a username Pedro tech and the password Pedro. And also it also auto generates an ID for this user. You see that not only that, but this data exists inside of our um, inside of our actual database in the in the cloud as well, you can see it appears over here. So what I want to do now is I want to run this API call this endpoint over here, and see if it will return back this user that we just created. So to make this API request, we can obviously create a front end that is going to make the whole request, or we can use some sort of API, like testing software, like Postman or Insomnia to test this out. And the one I like to use is Insomnia, you can download it in the description. This is the software over here. It's really simple to use. You don't even have to pay or anything. All you do is you click on new request by clicking on this button and choosing an HTTP request. Then you put the link to your API. So the API obviously will be uh, probably something like HTTP uh, local host 3001. And since we are in the auth route, we have to put slash auth. And since we are going to make a request to the register endpoint, we have to put slash register. Now this is a post request, not a get request. So we have to change it to a post request. And we're not sending anything right now. Um, actually, we should we should send a username and a password, right? So if I try to make this request right now, you'll see it will say no, because it couldn't find any users, I hope with this with because we didn't send anything, right. But if I come right here right now, I change this to be a JSON, right, we're sending to uh, a JSON as the body. And we put over here a username. And we use Pedro tech. And we put in a password. And we put in uh, whatever, because the password actually doesn't matter because we didn't do anything with the password. As you can see, it is sending back the user with the username Pedro tech, meaning that our connection between our code and our database has been successfully uh, established, right? So everything seems to be working, which is perfect. So let's continue writing the code for registering a user. So one thing I want to preface this with is basically, if this is your first time creating a register login system, this will all be confusing for you. It, it just will be because it was for me and it was for everyone I've ever taught how to do something like this. Um, I recommend just taking some time to look over the code, understand, understand every step. And with time, you'll understand, but I'm just advising you that it might get a little bit confusing. But don't worry, I'll explain every step. So what we're going to do now is we just search for a user in our database with the username sent from the front end, right? So now we want to check to see if, if it returned no or not, because if it returned no, so if there's if if the user um, is already inside of the database, right? then you're trying to register with a user with a username that already exists, which means that we don't want to continue trying to create another user, we actually want to return and give a response dot JSON uh, with a message saying that 
this user already exists. So what we're doing here is we're checking to we're trying we're, we're getting the username that was sent from the front end. Uh, we're checking to see if there's already a user with that username. And if there is, then we're returning, we're ending this function over here, and we're returning a JSON with this message. But if this pass if this check over here passes, so we get to this part where we there there's no user with this username. So it's good to go to create this user. So what we do now is we use bcrypt to hash the password. The reason why we want to hash the password is because you see right now, uh, in our database, it says that the password is Pedro, right? But this is extremely unsafe, you should never have strings like plain texts as a password, because if this leaks, um, it will become really easy for uh, hackers to see the user's passwords. So what you want to do is you want to hash that password. So I'm going to create over here a variable called hashed password. And I'm going to set it equal to await bcrypt dot hash. So bcrypt will be used for this for hashing passwords. And we're going to put over here, the password that we want to hash, and we can put a number, um, this number, it doesn't really matter for you to know what it means, but it just influences the, the hashing process of our password. Um, I'm gonna put 10 because it's the default. And it's what I always put. So <laughs> uh, I wouldn't worry that much about this. But basically, we just created a version of our password that is now hashed. And this is what we're going to actually send to our database. Now, we want to add the user to our database. So what we do is we create a variable called new user, set it equal to new user model, and just create the user with the two fields that we defined. So the username field, and the password field, but the password we want to pass is not the password that we got over here. It's actually the hashed password, right? Hashed password. So now this is how you actually add something to a database in, in MongoDB with mongoose, you just say new user model, create this variable. And then if you want to make the changes, you just say new user dot save. And this should create the user, I'm also going to put in a weight over here. Now, um, if this is successful, we should actually just return back a message saying something like, um, I don't know, like user registered successfully, something like this. Um, and then just save, right? So now let's test to see if everything over here is working, I'll delete this user that we manually created, because now we don't need to manually create over here, we should be able to create users using our API. So I'm going to put a password called Pedro at one, two, three, and then send this request, you'll see that it says user register successfully, which I hope means that if I refresh this, uh, by clicking on find. Now we have a user with a username page attack, but the password is completely hashed we can't make sense of this password because that's how it's supposed to be. Now, let me try creating another user with the same username. You'll see that now it should say that user already exists, exists, meaning that it won't allow us to do this. So this is pretty great. It means that our registration API endpoint is pretty much done. So now we have to create the login endpoint, the login is a little bit more complicated, because it will involve some JSON web token logic, right? Because what happens is, when you want to log into an application, you want to create what is known as a token, which is going to represent your login session, then you want to send that back to the front end. And whenever a user in the front end makes a request, they need to prove that they are the original users that were logged in. So they should send that token to the request. And every time you make a request, you should validate to see if they are the authenticated users. That's a whole concept in, in web dev that um, it's hard to understand in the beginning. But I'm going to show you guys a simple implementation of how this would work using JSON web tokens and Mern. So to create the login route, we're going to do something similar to what we did over here, we're going to um, create an async callback function, which is going to include a rec, a res, and pretty much just this, then what we're going to get from the front end is also pretty much the same, right? When you log in, you should send in a username and a password, then um, we want to do something very similar again, which is we'll try to find a user with uh, this username, just like this. But this time, the problem is not when we find a user. So instead of saying if user, we're going to say, if not user, because if we don't find a user, it means that you try to log in with an account that doesn't exist. Or so 
we'll just say return res.json and say something like uh, message, uh, let me see, message user doesn't exist, something like this. Then over here, we have to check to see if the user exists, right? You try to log in with a username that is in our database. Um, that's fine. But now we need to check to see if the password that you have matches the password that is on the database. So what we do is we create this variable called is password valid. And we're going to be using Bcrypt to determine this because Bcrypt, uh, you can't actually unhash a password that has been hashed. So when you send the password like this, right to the database, we can actually never know what the password originally was because when you hash something, you can't unhash it. But what we can do to know if what you're inputting is the correct password is we can hash what you just input it. And if it's the same thing as this value over here, then perfect, it's it's the same password. Because the algorithm for hashing will always return the same value. So that's why we use Bcrypt over here and a function they have called compare, where we just put in the password we want to compare it with, with the original password in the database, which we can get by saying user.password, because we just found the user with this username, and we want to compare it to the user with this username, right? So if it is valid, this should become true. If it's not, it should become false. So if it is valid, or if it's not valid, actually, if password, if is password is not true, then again, we want to end this request right here by saying res.json. And the message will be um, username or password is incorrect, something like this. And then if it is valid, so you're correctly logging in, now is where we start the process for logging in with the correct information. So we first create a token by saying const token is equal to jwt.sign. And this is how we create a token using JSON web tokens, right? We have this, um, we have this JWT thing we imported at the top. So now we are using it by saying jwt.sign. And when you sign, you can actually sign some data. What I'm going to sign is the ID of the user by saying ID is equal to user dot under slash ID. Then I need to put a secret for this token. So our, ter our token will be basically a, a string of numbers and letters uh, that makes no sense, but can be converted into this object over here. So this piece of data. And this secret over here is really important because it should be used uh, whenever you want to un unsign or <laughs> it's not unsign, but verify if uh, the user is really authenticated, you need to use it, right? So whenever you use it, when we're trying to verify that we need to use the same secret we put over here. But for simplicity reasons in this video, I'm just going to show you guys the secret. It's literally the word secret, but I recommend you creating an environment variable and using it over here. So now that we created our token, what we want to do is we want to end this request by saying res.json and sending back the token that we just created. And also I want to send back the user ID so that we can store it inside of our project. So I'm going to say user dot under slash ID. And yeah, this this should be fine. So I'm going to save this right here. And um, let's test to see if the login functionality is working. I'll create another request over here, similar to this one, I'm going to copy this paste it over here. But instead of being register, we're going to have the login thing over here, then this is also a post request, and it should be accepting JSON. Now I'm going to copy this and paste it over here. And we'll try to log in with the incorrect password. I'll just write something that is wrong. You'll see that it should say username or password is incorrect. But if I try logging in with uh, the correct password, it should return back a token and our user ID. Now let's try logging in with a user that doesn't even is not even registered into an account, it'll say user doesn't exist, which means that everything seems to be working pretty smoothly. And this also means that pretty much our user functionality is done because like we, we just finished the the whole functionality of logging in and registering. Now to keep you guys engaged, I don't think I should finish the entire back end um, before going into the front end because I feel like a lot of what we can we're gonna be creating might not be registering in your in your heads, because you're not seeing a visual representation of what we're creating 
in our backend. So what I like to do is I start out creating the backend, but I start out by creating a portion of the backend, which in our case is the login and registration, because you guys are probably used to seeing logging like this kind of stuff in websites, right? So now that we've done this, I'm going to go and start creating the react front end that communicates with this. And when the user in the front end is able to register and log in, we're going to write a little bit of the front end for um, the recipe part, and then come back to create the API for that. So I think this process will maintain you guys as engaged as, prob as, as possible, because it will keep you guys uh, learning different stuff and not become very monotone. So like just working on the back end for a long time, and then go to the front end and just working on the front end, right? I think it, this is a better process to teach you guys this. So if we want to start working with our front end, let's close all of this stuff over here. And let's open up the client folder inside of our project. I'm going to delete some files that already come with react because all I have right now is the um, simple create react app, I can run this app by going to my client uh, terminal and running yarn start. And it will generate, uh, it will open up inside of my browser, as you can see, and obviously it'll come with a boilerplate from create react app. However, we're going to delete some stuff. So like, we're going to delete this set of test file, the report web vitals file, the logo, the index.css and the app.test.js. So we're moving everything from to trash because we're not going to be using them. I'm going to delete the instances where they are being called or used in our project. And in their app.js, let's start from zero just like this. And as you can see, we just have an empty page. Okay, so one of the first things I want to do is install some of the packages we're going to be using inside of our client. So inside of our react application, I'm going to open up another terminal, this one will be used to install packages, then I'm going to cd into my client folder. And I'm going to run yarn add, um, or if you're using npm, it's npm install, and we're going to install the following packages. So we're going to install react uh, router DOM which will be used to create routes and different pages inside of our website, then I'm gonna install Axios for fetching data. And finally, uh, I'm gonna install react cookie for um, for dealing with cookies in react, right? So I'm gonna press enter, it's gonna start installing everything. And what I want to do is I want to start everything by setting up our route system inside of um, inside of our app.js. So at the top over here, I'm gonna import some stuff from react router dom. So what I'm going to import is, first of all, the browser router, and we're going to change its name to router. And then we're going to import the routes component, and the route component. So if you're familiar with react router dom, this should be pretty self explanatory. All of them have their own purposes. Uh, the way we structure it is basically we define first our router to determine where in our app, we're going to have routes, it's all going to be inside of the app um, div, then we're going to create over here, uh, the routes component and wrap all of our individual routes with this um, inside of the routes component. So in our routes, what we're going to define is we're going to find a path for it. And the first one will be for the home page. So I'm going to define an empty slash as the like the the URL of the website is the default uh, route, then we're going to put an element over here. And the element is just the component which is going to be rendered when you go to this path. So the component we want to render is the we haven't created it yet, but we're going to create a folder over here called pages, just like this. And instead of pages, we're going to have the three different pages we're going to have in our app, actually, it probably will be four pages because we need the authentication page as well. So let's create some of them. Let's create the home.js, which will be a page for the home component, then let's come create one for the authentication, which is going to be for registering and um, logging in. Um, then let's do it for the, the create recipe page. So create recipe.js. And let's put one for the saved recipes.js, just like this. Now to define this components, all you have to do is just say export const home for the home component, and return some sort of uh, UI uh, specifying something about this component. So for the home page for now, we'll just render the div with the text home. Now we'll copy this and do it for each one of this as well, but change the name of the components and what we write over here. And uh, we're just initially creating the the first uh, image of each component, right? So the create recipe, and we'll do the same for create 
recipe. And finally, for saved recipes, we'll do the same. So recipes, just like this, saved recipes. Now that we created all of our pages, at least the beginning of it, we'll close these tabs and we'll import them over here at the top, we can automatically import them by trying to, uh, for example, for the home page, I'll just say that the home component uh, will be used over here. And they should have an import, but they actually don't. So we'll just do this. And we'll import the home component like this dot slash pages slash home and we'll import the home component. Now we'll do the same for the other routes, we'll have four routes. So we can just uh, paste four of these routes, we'll make one for the um, authentication. And this will be the auth component. Um, then this will be for the create recipe. And this will be the create recipe component. And finally, this will be for saved recipes. So we'll go for the saved recipes component, we will have to obviously change and import all of those over here. We'll change this to auth, this to create recipe and this to saved recipes. And then we'll change this to auth, <laughs> the same thing, right? Create recipe, it's kind of uh, repetitive, but you guys get the point. So saved recipes. Now, our app should have some routes. So we're in the default URL. So it's showing the home page. But if I go to the um, auth, for example, it should show auth, if I go to the create recipe, it should show create recipe. So our routing system seems to be working. Now that we have our routing system done, we have to have the uh, functionality to be able to navigate between the routes. So obviously, we can just change our URL normally, like we're, we've been doing. However, every website must have a nav bar if you're going to have multiple routes. So we're going to be creating that right now. So to create the nav bar, we're going to create another folder over here, which is going to be used for uh, whenever we want to add components that are not pages, right? So a component like a nav bar component would be applicable over here. So we're going to write over here navbar.js. And we're going to uh, create the navbar component. So export const navbar is equal to um, this function. So how we're going to do this is as follows, we're going to first of all, uh, return a div, which will have a class name of um, navbar. Then inside of here, we're going to set up all of our links that are going to be used inside of our routes. So I'm going to import over here at the top from react router DOM. And I want to import the link component, just like this, then I want to set up first the link to the home page. So I'll just write a link like this and wrap it around with the text that is going to be used for the URL. So home will be what <laughs> the link text. So we'll just put over here a prop called to and this is where you put where you want to navigate when you click on the link. So I'm going to navigate to the home page whenever I click on the home link, then we're going to do the exact same thing for all of the other links, which for now will be just four. Uh, we're going to do again, the auth. actually, I'll put the create recipe here. Uh, and then create recipe. Uh, I wrote it wrong. So create recipe, then we're going to put over here the saved recipes one and saved recipes. And then finally, we'll do the auth. And we'll write here probably something like login slash register. Now, we'll save this and import this over here. So we'll import from dot slash component slash navbar, and we'll import the navbar component. And we have to put it above the routes uh, component, but below the router. The reason for that is because inside of the routes, you should only put routes, right, like the definition of routes. But if you put the navbar above the router component, it won't be able to use components from react router DOM, such as the link component. So we have this perfect space in between them to put uh, the navbar component. So I'll put this right like this. And you'll see that now we have our beautiful navbar, right? And it does look ugly. But don't worry, like I said, all the CSS will come with time. In fact, I'm actually going to paste all the CSS that I wrote for this code already just in case while well, we we put in uh, class names and stuff, it will automatically show the UI for you. Again, like I said, I'm not going to show me writing CSS like I, I never do this in my videos, because I find it a waste of time when the focus of the video is not CSS. But if you guys want to use this CSS, 
Uh, it's really simple and ugly. <laughs> if you guys want to use it, just check the link in the description or just copy what I'm showing you guys right here. So enough of CSS for the rest of the video. This is how the UI is looking right now. So what we do now is we basically have our nav board done. So we have to choose which page we want to start working on. Now, in order to do anything in our app, we pretty much want to be authenticated. So let's start with the auth um, component. Not to mention, we only wrote the backend for logging in and registering. So it makes sense to start with the auth component. So over here in our div, we'll have a class name of auth, just to define our auth page. Then inside over here, we're going to actually call two components, we're going to make two separate components, one for logging in, and one for registering. Um, just like this, register, we obviously haven't created them yet, but we're going to create them right now. Now, you might argue that since they are external components, we should probably put them on the components folder. But for simplicity reasons, I just want to put the components folder components that are shared between different pages or that is useful for the whole app. So these two are only useful for the auth page. So I will actually create them all inside of the same file. I'll create the login component over here. And I'll create I'll just return something, I'll create the register one over here as well. I want to have a page with both of them, like you guys saw in the beginning of the video. Now to start off, let's work with the register, right? Because you want to be able to register first to then be able to log in. So for the register, we want to have a div, we're going to give a class name of auth container. Then instead of this div, we want to have a form because it's the form for registering. Now, instead of a form, we want to have a couple of stuff. So I want to have a little h2 tag over here, which will say this is the register part of or the registration part of the the page, then we want to have a div, which and this is just for organization purposes and UI purposes, I want to get a div with the class name of form group, which I already assigned in my CSS file. Now inside of this uh, div, I want to put in a label. And the label will be representative of the username field. Now, when you have a, a label that is representing a field, you have to put in the HTML4 tag to to, sh to tell uh, your UI that this label is referring to the input with the um, name call or the ID called um, username. So we're going to come over here, we're going to put an input. And this input will be of type text, just like this text. And we want to give an ID of username to uh, match the one for the label, then we're going to give an on change to this. But obviously, we currently don't have um, any states that are going to be representing this input, we're going to create that in a second. But before we do that, I want to leave this like this, just close in this div and create the same thing, but for the password, because we just created one for the username, but we'll create one for the password like this. And now it should pretty much be done. Right. So now we're in track for creating our states that are going to represent the registration and password um, uh, input fields, right. So how do we do this? Well, over here at the top, we're going to say const equals to use state, which when we press enter, it's going to automatically import this from react, then this will be a string. We're going to create one for the username. And it, it needs a function called set username. And we'll do the same thing for the password. So we'll create one for the password, and set password. Then over here, we're going to uh, copy the set username and just whenever there's any changes in our input, we're going to set the username equal to the event .target value, which basically means that we're setting the username state to be equal to the value of the field every time there's any changes in the field, which makes sense, right? Then we're going to do the exact same thing with the password one, uh, but change this to set password. I also want to set the values of the inputs to their own states. So this will be username. And this will be password. Now, basically, what, what what's happening is we have, uh, if we go to the login and register, we should see one input field with uh, no one form group with a, for registration, and you should have a username and a password. And as I'm typing on this, it's actually saving the values of what I type into this two states over here, which will then send this data to our API to 
actually register. Now the UI for this is almost pretty much done. All we have to do is below this div, we'll put a button uh, of type uh, submit, but we're gonna uh, call it register and give the type a submit. Because when you submit the form, uh, this but when you click on this button, it will submit the form. So now we pretty much finished the register, we'll do the exact same thing for the login. But the only difference is that the logic and API requests that we make while handling the data will be a little bit different. So technically, what I think would be good would be to actually um, copy this paste it over here. Uh, obviously change this to login. So the components are pretty much the same. The only difference is that uh, I'm going to actually create over here at the bottom a form uh, components, I'm going to say const uh, form uh, equals to uh, this function. And it's going to take in two different props, one is going to be the username and set username, it's actually four props, but two groups. And the second one is the password and set password, right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy all of this UI logic over here. And just return this, right. So why am I doing this? Well, because when I return this, uh, right here at the bottom, we're going to save on uh, having to copy code, we can just actually come over here, replace all of this stuff with returning the form component, keep the actual register and login components, uh, with the purpose of just handling the logic. So for the form component, we'll pass in the username, and the username like this, as a prop, then the same thing for set username, uh, we'll pass in as props. And the same thing for password, we'll pass in as props and for set password. Now this is a very simple, simplified version of what we're doing over here, we're keeping our register component to be uh, purely for logic. So over here, we'll put the API request and everything like that. And we created this form component, which we now we can use it both on the register and also on the login component, just like this. So you see the components are pretty much the same. But what's going to change is what we, the logic we write in between over here, and the form will be reused how many times we want, because we are using props to differentiate them, which is pretty good. Now you can see that we have two forms, one for register and one for login, I just realized, since we put the register label over here, uh, inside of the form, uh, it's going to say register for both. One way to change this is we can actually put another prop over here called uh, label. And we pass in the label over here as um, register. And the label over here as login. And now what changes is the fact that we'll use this label to display the texts. So we'll display that. And we'll display this and you'll see that now they're different. This is for login, it says login, and this is for register, it says register. One thing important to understand why we're separating them is because the username fields over here, and the username fields over here, uh, shouldn't be the same value, it's, they should be different. That's why we're separating them. Now, it's time to start making our first API requests to our own API. Um, so what we want to do is let's start with the register, we're gonna have a function that we're gonna pass into our form called the handle submit function. Now this function will pass in as props. So let's call it handle submit, or on submit, actually, it's better on submit. And this function is going to be called whenever you submit the form. So over here, we're gonna put in the on submit prop, and then just pass in the on submit prop that we're passing through our form. Now over here in our register, we can pass this in and uh, create the on submit for our register. So const on submit is just a normal function. But it's also going to be an asynchronous function. So async over here. Now, we want to uh, use axios for this to work, right? We also want to get the event over here to say that we don't want to we want to prevent default in order for uh, whenever we submit the the form, it won't like uh, refresh the page. So we'll just say event dot prevent default like this. And what we want to do is we want to use axios to send a post request to our API. So I'm going to import all all over here, I'm going to import axios 
from Axios. And if you're not familiar with Axios, it's actually a pretty simple library, it's just a replacement from the for the fetch API. Uh, in my opinion, it's easier to handle. Um, in more complex projects, I don't use either of them. I use um, actually I use fetch, but I, I use different types of, of uh, fetching libraries. But for this project, we're just using Axios because it's going to be as simple as possible. So we're going to try catch uh, because we're going to use an await. So we need to do try catch or you can use promises as well if you're if you're if you prefer that. But what we're going to try is we're going to try to uh, await uh, axios.post request. Now for the post request, we need to put over here the URL for our API. So open up our insomnia. And I'm going to open up for the registration one, copy this and paste it over here. Now, the way you structure this is you make the post request, you put the URL, and then right over here, you pass in an object that is going to be the object for the body of the request. So if you recall, in our API over here, when we uh, handle the registration request, we assume that in the front end, we're going to send in a username and a password. So this is exactly what we have to send in over here, we have to send in an object with a username and a password, which is exactly what we have over here. So in case this works, we're going to alert a message saying registration completed. Then now you have to log in. Because uh, you just registered the user you didn't actually logged them in. Uh, if there's any error, uh, we're going to keep it simple. I'm just going to I just want to see as the developer I want to see the error. So I'm going to console log the error or console console error the error because this actually will make the, the text red in the in your console. But this is pretty much it for the registration. It's really simple. Uh, this is all that we want. We just want to try to make this request and we can try this out, right? We'll open up our MongoDB compass over here. We'll try to find to see if there's how many documents are here. We see there's only one user Pedro tech. But now let's try to create a user with a different username. I'll try to create one called um, I don't know, Jack uh, DR. I don't know what, why that, <laughs> that was auto completed. The password will be password. Uh, oh, I just realized the password field is not an actual password field. Uh, I should change that I'll change this to be from input text to input password. And now you see it's a password field. But basically, if we click register, it should say registration completed. So no errors occurred. And we should find that this user should be over here, which they are, which means that we finally were able to set up a clear connection between our front end and our API. So now, we are pretty much done with our registration. Let's start working with the login. Now for the login, it's a little bit harder because uh, we're going to have some stuff to deal with, we need to authenticate all the kind of stuff. Um, and to do that, we're going to come over here, we're going to create the on submit for the login. So const on submit, uh, similar to the registration one, again, this has to be async. And we're going to just pass the on submit as a prop to the form like this. Now, we have to uh, grab the event again, and say event dot prevent default. And now over here, we're gonna set up our try and catch, right? So far, it's pretty much the same thing as before. Uh, we'll even already console dot error, the error. But in the try is where stuff starts to get interesting. We're going to try to make a, re a post request similar to the registration one. But the difference is now we care what we get back from this request. In the registration one, we're not really, it doesn't really matter what we get back because I don't think we even send anything from this request. Um, we just try to create the user. So we don't, we're not expecting the API to send anything back really. Um, but over here, we are because if you recall, we send back our authentication token. So over here, I'll do the same thing as we did before. But right in the await, I'm gonna grab the response from this request, just like this, and this response should receive everything that is sent back from the API, not to mention this should change to login. And also, uh, this is the structure between the login and registration routes are pretty much the same, we're also sending the username and password from this component. Now, when you get the, the response back, we can take a look to see how it will look right. Uh, but pretty much what it will look like is just the token, right, the token that um, we're sending the the JWT that we're sending from the backend. So what I want to do with that is I actually want to uh, set 
the token into our cookies. So to do that, we have to come over here at the top and import uh, a hook from the react cookie library. This hook is going to be called use cookies. And to set it up, we'll just come over here inside of our login component and call the use cookies hook like this, define the name of our cookie that we want to create, which in our case will be called access token. And then over here, we're going to, uh, we actually don't need to have access to the cookie, we only have to, we only need to have access to the function that sets a cookie. So we're going to grab the set cookies function. And we'll use it right over here um, to set the response that we get back from the API as our cookie by basically saying that we want to set the access token cookie to have a value of response dot data dot token because if we go to our routes over here, you'll see that in the login, we send back a JSON, which is an object containing a token field and a user ID field. So that's pretty much what we're doing over here. Now, now that we're setting the, the cookie uh, to have that value, we also want to store our uh, user ID that we're sending back inside of our local storage for quick access to it. So I'll say I want to get the window dot local storage dot set item. And we want to set a user ID item to have a value of the response dot data dot user ID like this. And finally, what I want to happen when you log in is I want to be redirected to our homepage, right? So there's multiple ways of doing this, you can actually just say something like window dot location, uh, I think it's window dot location dot path name, something like that, and set the path, but I'm keeping track of the location using React Router DOM. So let's import something from React Router DOM, um, which I recommend using if you're using React Router DOM for navigation. Uh, let's import the use navigate hook. This hook is pretty simple. Whenever you want to redirect yourself based on like on command, you just call this hook like this, uh, navigate equal to use navigate. And now this over here is a function that when you call it, it will navigate and redirect you to whichever uh, path you put inside of this quotes over here, which in our case is just a homepage. So it's an empty slash. So this code should be working. Let's test it out. We'll open up our inspect element, we'll go to application, you see that in our local storage, there's nothing here. But if I try to log in with our, um, I'll try to log in with check the again. Uh, you'll see that we are redirected to our homepage, which means that it probably worked. And also if I go to application, now our user ID is uh, inside of our local storage, which should match the user ID of Jack. Uh, yeah, it does match as you can see over here. So the login functionality seems to be working, which is pretty good. But one thing really quick that I want to fix is the fact that uh, we're logged in, but the login and register thing over here still appears, we actually want to whenever you're logged in, replace this with a button that when you click will log you out. So to do that, it's pretty simple, we actually come over here to our code, we um, just go to our nav bar right over here. And inside of our uh, links over here, we want to have access to our access token cookie, because as long as we have a token, um, then it pretty much means that we are authenticated, right? We're logged in. Um, obviously, there's more checks that we can put, like we can check to see if it is this if the token is the same token. Um, and we in a real website, you should probably do this. But for simplicity reasons, we're gonna actually just check to see if the token exists. So to do that, we'll import similar to what we've done so far, we'll import from the react cookie library. And we want to import the use cookies uh, hook. Again, we're just gonna set it like this use cookies, uh, we want the uh, one with the access token which is the one we created. And over here, we're going to grab the cookies this time. And also we might want to in the future, uh, inside of this component, uh, alter the cookie. So we'll grab both things from the hook. But the most important one right now is the cookies one, because what we want to check is, okay, if there is no cookies, uh, dot auth uh, access token, it means that you're not logged in. So we should actually show the link for logging in. But if there is uh, an access token, it means that you are already logged in. So we should actually display a button saying log out. 
like this. You'll see that this is exactly what happens because um, we are logged in. But when I click on it, nothing happens. Now the logout functionality will be pretty simple. All we do is we come over here, we create a function called uh, logout. And we pretty much just need to clear our tracks, like we need to reset the cookies uh, to be an to be empty. So we'll set the access token to be an empty cookie like this. Uh, then we probably want to clear our local storage from our user ID. So I'll remove the item called user ID like this. And we probably want to uh, navigate to uh, to our authentication page because you just logged out. So when you click on the logout, you should probably want to log in again. So we'll do uh, this thing where we're going to just call the use navigate again, like this, then just like we just done it, we'll just call the navigate function, and the use navigate hook. And we'll just navigate to the auth page. So let's check this out, we are logged in, we can refresh the page, it's, it's always logged in. But when I click on this button, uh, nothing seems to work. Oh, I know why actually, <laughs> I know why. I'm sorry, I didn't I never uh, set this function to be called when you click on the button. Now it should work. So I'll refresh this click log out, we're back in our auth page, and we don't have the logout button anymore. So our front end for this seems to be working perfectly, which is amazing. Okay, so now I actually think it would be better for me to start working on the API for the recipes part of the app because now we've done registration, we've done the back end and the front end, I think actually you guys are starting to get an idea of how both the back end and the front end are connected. So it would be good to just start creating the API for this and then come back to the react part of it. So let's open up our Visual Studio code. Um, let's close our client over here. And let's open up our um, back end, right? So we've created our model for users and our routes for users. But now we have a different type of data. We want to keep track of recipes, right? A user should be able to create a recipe, should be able to save a recipe, see the recipes, all of that stuff. So for that, we need to create a new model called recipes. So uh, I'll actually create a new file over here. Let's call it recipes.js. So inside of this file, it's very similar to what we've done so far, we're going to import mongoose from the mongoose library. And if you recall, this is how we structure our schemas, right, I'm going to copy this so that we can we can save time writing. Um, it's going to be very similar. The difference is, this is going to be called a recipe schema. And um, then this over here, obviously, we're going to change this the data inside of it. But this will be called recipe model. And this over here is the name of our schema, right inside of our MongoDB, we have currently the users one, we want to create one called recipe, or recipes, right? I just realized since the database is called recipes, that's actually a horrible name for it. I apologize, because the name of the collection will be recipes, this probably should have been called something like a recipes app or something like that. However, uh, there's no point in changing now. Let's just keep it like that. We'll just have a collection with the same name as a database. So over here, we're going to call it recipes like this. And we're going to pass in our recipe schema. Now, how are we going to structure this data? Well, the way we do this is we want each recipe to have, um, first of all, the name of the, the item, right, the food that you're going to create a recipe for, and it will have a type of string and it will also be required, right, you need you need this um, in order to, to create a recipe. Now, we also want uh, to keep track of the ingredients. But the thing with ingredients is that um, it should be of type string, right, because each ingredient is of type string. And it again, needs to be required because to make a recipe, you need the, the ingredients. But if you recall, it's ingredients, meaning that it's multiple of them, you can have multiple ingredients inside of a recipe. So to make this represent an array of type string, we just wrap this around with um, some square brackets. And now um, MongoDB will know that this is uh, an array of strings, then we need instructions, or instruction, um, it will be again, of type string, and required be equal to true then we're going to have an image URL. So an image for the food, it will be of type string, I'm just going to copy this. Because um, <laughs> a lot of the stuff is just strings. Um, but then we have the cooking time, right? Cooking time, how long it takes to cook it. 
Uh, this one will be a little bit different because the type will be number, not whatever this is. Now, finally, we need to um, make the setup a reference between um, this uh, a recipe and the user who created the recipe. We need to keep track of the user who created the recipe. So to do that, we're going to come over here and say user owner. This will be a field in our recipe schema, which is going to refer to the idea of the user who um, created this recipe. The way we structure this is pretty simple. We just say that the type of this will actually be of type mongoose.schema.types. So you can actually get the MongoDB types or uh, the mongoose types by accessing it like this. And there's a lot of types that you can uh, manually input. And we could have done it for strings and numbers as well, instead of just writing string. But I find, I find that writing string and number like this, it's way easier than writing this whole thing. The problem is that with ID, since user owner will be the ID of the user, um, we should refer it to um, this specific type because it is the type that um, usually exists for IDs, as you can see in MongoDB. So this is the type. We also want to say that this um, oh, I don't know how I opened that. So we can also say that this makes a reference to the users table, right? And finally, we want to say that this is required, just like this. So now we're pretty much done with our recipe schema. Um, if we check over here, let me try reloading this to see if um, it will already appear. I don't think it will. Uh, yeah, it didn't appear. But uh, pretty much Oh, yeah, because we haven't used it. But pretty much this, as you can see, we created our schema. So how do we what do we do now? Well, we basically create a route file for our recipes. So I'll create recipes.js. And inside of here, we import the model that we just created. So recipe model, I just wrote it because it will automatically import. And don't forget, since we changed the type for this back into module, uh, we need to come over here and put the .js or else it won't work. So now that we've done this, we can start creating our recipes route. So what we do is we import express from express like this, then we need to import mongoose as well. So import mongoose from mongoose, then we know that we have the recipe model. So for now, that should be fine. So we will first create our router. So router equals to express dot router. And right at the end, like we've done before, we're just going to export this thing. But we're going to export this router with a different name, we're going to call it. Um, let's call it recipe router like this. Now in our index.js, we're going to import this uh, by saying by just copying this and uh, changing this to recipes and this to recipe router should be recipes router actually makes more sense. Keep it uh, keep it the same. And then we're just going to apply this like this. And we're going to change the route for our recipes route to be recipes and this to be recipes router like this. Now, um, we should come to our recipes uh, file over here. And we're going to um, press enter. And we're going to set up first the first route that we're going to set up is just uh, a getter uh, like a get route, which will be an API request, which is just going to return all of the recipes that it can find inside of the database. This is what we're going to call inside of the home page, because the home page, we want to see all the recipes in our database just displayed normally. So the way we do this is by making an API request, a get request to uh, to this specific route. And similar to how we did the previous routes file, we're going to make this an asynchronous function, it will have a rec and a res. And the callback function will be pretty simple, we're going to have a try catch, right? Um, as you guys might already be familiar with, um, again, an error over here, uh, the error, if there's any errors, we're just going to return a JSON with the error, like this. But if we don't have any errors, we want to um, make an API request by saying const response equals to await. And the way we get the data from um, a specific model or specific collection is we grab this model, this collection, we say dot find. And we put over here an empty, um, 
uh, object, right? What this empty object means is um, you can actually find based on specific fields and you can put those conditions inside of here. But since we have no conditions of what we want to find in the recipes collection, we just want to find all of them, this should return all of the uh, all of the documents in that collection. So all of that will be stored inside of this response variable over here, which can then uh, we just can just send it back to our front end by saying uh, res.json response. Now, we don't have any um, current recipes in our database, right? We haven't created anything. Um, so it doesn't make sense for us to call that right now. Uh, it will make more sense when we create a new recipe. So let's write the route to create a new recipe so we can test all of this up. So it will be a post request because we're kind of creating something. Um, so post is used for that. And what we want to do is um, we want to change this, we'll, we'll just keep it the same, right? The the post actually, we'll keep it the same. Because when you're making a post request to the recipes route, it makes sense that it's expected that you're creating a new recipe. Now, all of this should remain the same, even the dot catch and the try. So we want to come over here, and we want to um, create a value called recipe, similar to what we did with the users. Remember, when we were adding a new user in the register one, we need to create a new instance of that model. So not here, actually, it's it's here, we need to create a new instance of that model. So that's what we're doing, we're creating a new recipe. So const recipe is equal to new recipe model. And what we put over here is the structure of the data of how that model will look like. So technically, um, we're going to get all of the information. So like the the name, the image URL, the, the ingredients, the instruction, the cooking time, everything from the body, we're going to send all of that from the body of this request. So we can just um, put over here saying that this object will basically just be the request body. This little notation over here just means that um, we're setting this object to have the fields of this object over here. However, um, it doesn't make sense to do it this way, we can actually just close this and just say that the recipe model will have the rec body just like this, right? And this should work perfectly. Now, what we want to do is we want to try to await a recipe model, actually not recipe model, we'll just say recipe, the one that we just created, dot save. And if it works out, then we should uh, probably just return back whatever uh, we get back from this, right? Uh, which shouldn't be anything I think we just actually let's just return the recipe it makes sense, right? Um, and we don't even need to get any response because I don't think it will provide us with anything useful. So what we can do now, um, actually, let's just return the response. Yeah, I think it will be the same thing, but uh, with the ID from the item created already. So this is our post request. And it seems pretty simple, right? So let's try reloading this, um, we're gonna, for the first time, try to make a request to uh, create a recipe. So we'll create a new request here in insomnia, we're going to copy all of this and put it over here. Now it's in the recipe route. So instead of auth, we're going to put recipes slash, uh, actually, we don't need to put any slash because uh, it's just a post request, right? We just put an empty slash and I think it is recipes, right? Yeah, that's right. So now what we have to do is we come over here, we change this to um, a JSON, and we need to put in some data. So first, we need to put in uh, the name, right? So let's write name. And the name of this recipe that we're creating a fake one, let's just call it steak, just to keep it simple. So we're, we're putting the recipe for a steak. Now we need a description, right? Uh, did I even put description in the in this data in the model? Let me check. Mm, I don't think I did. So yeah, let's not put description then. Yeah, let's not put description. So I'm gonna save this over here. I remove this. Then over here, we're just going to put um, ingredients. Now what ingredients do we need for steak? Since it's steak, and it's simple, we just need three things probably uh, meat, or beef actually, then uh, salt, and then pepper, something like this, right? Then what we need is the instructions. So we'll create some fake instructions will just say something like cook at medium at high heat. And then baste it, I don't know. <laughs> um, then 
for the image URL. I'm going to get an, a URL for this image real quick and be back in a second. Actually, I decided to uh, put everything already. So I didn't have to you guys didn't have to see me doing all of this. But basically, I put the image URL for a random picture of a steak. And I put the cooking time to 30. And I put the ID for the ID of the user Jack. Um, and let's test to see if this will work. So I'll click on the button. And you see, it says couldn't connect to server. So maybe there's an error. And it's good that there's errors because uh, I always like to, to show you guys um, how to fix this kind of stuff. So it seems like it is something related to uh, importing uh, incorrectly. So let's see. So uh, yeah, I forgot to put the dot JS over here. So I'm going to save this, you'll see now there's no errors. So let's try making the request again, I'm going to click send. And you see that it seems like it worked perfectly. Now the only way to check this is actually checking out our database, I'm going to reload the data. And you see that now we have a recipes collection because we finally made um, connection like we, we, we established a connection between our code with our database and this specific collection that we just created. More importantly, we see that the data that we just tried to create is over here. So we're properly inserting it into this collection. So this route seems to be working perfectly. Now there's another route which we already created, which we can test. So the recipes route over here, the get one, and the way we test it is by just probably just changing this to get I don't want to create a whole new thing. Uh, this over here wouldn't matter. Actually, I will create another one just for uh, so I can keep the JSON there uh, intact. I'm just going to copy this paste it over here and send this and you'll see that uh, we do get all of the recipes currently in our thing, which is just one but we do get them. So two of our routes for recipes seems to be working. So now the route that we want to create is the one that will allow us to save a recipe. And this route specifically is interesting because uh, we're gonna make some changes to one of our models. Um, we're gonna start off by just copying this and um, adding over here a post request to save a recipe. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna make this a put request and not put any routes over here. Then what we wanna do is we're gonna delete this over here. We actually want to um, get from the body of this request, we're going to get two things, we're going to get the uh, user ID, and the recipe ID. So what we want is we want people to save a recipe. Now how we're going to do this is by changing the model of our users to include a field called saved recipes, and that field will be an array of recipes that you saved. So if you want to do that, we have to come to our uh, users model over here. And we're going to add another field, this one's going to be called saved recipes. And we're going to make it into an array of type string, like this, actually, the type will be probably it's better to be mongoose dot schema dot types. Um, it has to be capital T dot types dot object ID, right, because it's a list of IDs. And we're going to make a reference to um, the recipes table. So now we have this field inside of our users. And what we can do is over here, we're going to get both the user ID and the recipe ID, we're using the user ID to find which user we want to change their saved recipes field. And we're going to get the recipe ID to insert into that array. So to do that, we're going to first uh, get the recipe. So we're gonna we're gonna do const recipe is equal to await um, recipes model um, dot find by ID. And we're going to put the uh, rec dot body dot recipe ID. So we're finding the recipe that uh, we want to save, then we're doing the exact same thing, but with the user, we're going to find the user who's saving the, the specific recipe. And for that, we need to have access to the user model. So we import that over here at the top. And then over here, we put the rec.body dot user ID, just like this. Now we have both the recipes and the users. So we're going to put it inside of the try. Um, and what we want to do in this case is after this, we want to grab the user dot saved recipes dot uh, push because we're adding to the end of the saved recipes from this specific user, we want to add the recipe, just like this, we want to save this user. So we're going to say await 
user.save, meaning that we're going to save the changes into our collection. At the end, we can just return back the saved recipes like this. Saved recipes is equal to user.saved recipes. And we're going to get back on the front end really simply. Now, this is pretty much it for this route. We can actually test this out if we wanted to by coming over here and doing that whole process. But I trust that it will work. If anything, in the front end, we can see if there's any mistakes and check back. Uh, I just don't want to waste time always going to Insomnia and adding more requests. So now we just need two more routes inside of this um, inside of this section. Um, they are two related to the saved recipes and related to getting the saved recipes. In the front end, we want to get a list of all of the recipe IDs that the user who's logged in to at the moment have saved. So um, to do that, we need to make a specific route that is going to get the IDs that were saved by a user given us a, a, a user ID. So we're going to call this route saved recipes. And we're going to put probably like IDs over here to signify that we're getting IDs from the saved recipes. And then we're going to create the async rec res and then create the function. And then um, we're going to put a try catch just like this. Um, catch error. And then we're going to obviously return the error if possible. And inside of the try catch, what we want to do is we just want to get the uh, first of all, the user who has the ID that we're going to send through the body. So we're going we're gonna to say const user is equal to await user model dot find by ID. We're just going to put the, the user ID we're going to send over here. Then we're going to uh, return back. So res dot JSON, uh, the saved recipe. So we're going to say saved recipes is equal to user dot saved recipes. Also, since this might be no, we can put over here a question mark, uh, just in case. Now we have to do our last route, which is going to be a route which is going to get uh, basically just the saved recipes, um, and not the IDs, right the whole thing. So we're just going to put saved recipes slash, um, actually no slash just saved recipes like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a user just like this using the user ID, then we're going to get um, we're going to try to find we're going to query for saved recipes, uh, where uh, the recipes model, like this recipe recipes model, or is it recipe model? Yeah, recipe model, where when we're trying to find them, we're trying to get those which their ID is in um, the user dot save recipes. So saved recipes from the user is an array of recipe IDs. So all we're seeing is we want to grab the saved recipes where their ID is inside of this list over here. It's a pretty nice like logical like notation that I find with uh, mongoose and I honestly really like doing stuff like this. Um, then what we can do is we can literally just give back the saved recipes just like this. Now we're pretty much done with our uh, back end for recipes. Now, in order to test this out, we should go to our front end and start generating the UI for this. Okay, so in order to create the UI for our recipes, let's start out by allowing ourselves to create a recipe, right? So since we've created all the endpoints, we can now start creating the individual pages. And the create recipe page is one of the most important ones, because it is where we're going to be having all the form which uh, you're able to create a recipe. So let's put over here uh, a div with class name equal to um, create recipe. And inside of here, what we want to do is we want to formulate a h2 tag saying create recipe, then uh, we want to put a form, which we're going to be using to to send the data. So form over here, and we're going to do similar to what we've done uh, in the login and registration, we're going to create a label uh, for each field. So the label for name will be an HTML for uh, an input with ID name, just like this. And then we just add the input like this. The type for this will be of type text and the ID will be name. And we'll just for now keep um, keep it like this. Let's not add anything else. So 
what I want to do now is I'll just fill out this form and I'll be back in a second because it's very repetitive. So I'll just show you guys all the inputs and labels we're going to have and be back when we're done. Okay, so as you can see, I filled in all of the inputs and labels. We have a label and a text area for the description. Okay, so I finished up over here all the inputs and labels. We have an input for the, the name, right? A label for the ingredients, but I haven't added the inputs for the ingredients because it's a little bit more complicated and we'll do in a second. But then we have a label for instructions, a text area for instructions, a label for the image URL, an input for the image URL, and then a label for the cooking time and an input which is of type number for the cooking time. So what we do now is we want to define the state that is going to keep track of the recipe we're trying to create. So right over here at the top, we're going to do um, create a state like this, let's call it recipe and set recipe and set this equal to use state, right? Now, at the top over here, we need to import the use state hook. So import from react the use state hook, just like this. Now, with the recipe, we wanted to find an initial structure to how this object will look like because it will be a whole object containing all of the inputs and text areas and, and stuff. So how this data will look like is as follows, it will have a name, which will be of type string. So initially, it will be empty string like this, then ingredients, which will be an array, so it will be an empty array, then we'll have some instructions, um, which will be of a, just a string as well, then image URL, which is a string, then we have cooking time, which is um, a number. So we start at zero. And then we have user owner, but I haven't shown you guys where to get the user owner ID yet. So for now, let's just keep it like this. So this is the format of our data. Now, we can easily change uh, and set this values equal to what is being written on the input by doing something like this, getting an on change for the input like this on change, then grabbing the event and then just setting the values to the specific um, state. But what I want to do is uh, since it's a big form and all of the functions are, are going to pretty much be the same, I want to create a function called handle change and it will um, do all of the logic and all we have to do is just put uh, call handle change in each input and it will perfectly work. So I'm going to put handle change over here, this function will take in an event. And then what it's going to do is it's going to first of all, get the um, um, name and value of that input. And that's where why I decided and I forgot to even mention you guys why I decided to get uh, put the name a name property on each input I forgot to put on this one. So um, you put a name property, and it's going to serve as the key equal to this thing over here so that whenever we want to handle the change, we can easily modify it by accessing the name. So each of them uh, are referring to their specific uh, things over here. So we get them from the event dot target like this. And then what we do is we just set the recipe uh, to be equal to a, an object that is exactly like the recipe was. However, the input with or the key name will have a new value, which is going to be the value that we put on the input. This logic might seem a little bit weird, but it makes sense, right? You're just changing uh, one specific part of the object by doing it this way. So now that we have this function done, um, we just pass it just like we just did with this input to all of the other inputs as well. Um, even the text area, everything should be pretty much the same. Um, and one of the coolest parts of this we're going to work on right now, which is adding the ability to add ingredients because our, our form right now, if I go to create recipe, you'll see that it looks like this, but the ingredient section obviously doesn't have um, anything. What we want to do is we want to have a button where when you click on it, it will add a new field, uh, a new input field over here. So if you click three times, you can add three ingredients, there will be three fields. So the way we structure this is by coming over here and adding a button, right, which will serve we'll just write add ingredient over here. And we can s just add a function to this button on an on click. Uh, and let's call it add ingredient. Like this. Now what we do is we create this function. And the function will be pretty simple. Um, there's many different ways you can actually uh, make this functionality work. The way I want to do it is um, we have this ingredients uh, array over here inside of the recipe object, right? So what I can do is I can just add an empty ingredient when I click on 
this button. What I mean by that is we'll come over here and we'll set the recipe uh, like this set recipe to be equal to whatever the recipe was before. So recipe, but now the ingredients field will have whatever the ingredients array was before. So we do recipe dot ingredients um, like this. And we put three dots to say that we want everything from the ingredients array plus whatever we put over here, which we'll just put an empty string, but for now. So let's think about it this way. So if you're not familiar with this uh, notation over here, all we're doing is we're setting the recipe object to be the same as it was before. And that's what the spread operator means. We're just keeping everything the same. But whatever you put after the comma over here is what's going to change in that object. In our case, we're changing the ingredients field, which initially, if you don't have any ingredients, it will be an empty array. But now we're changing it to be um, whatever the ingredients list was before. And again, this is what the spread operator is, plus whatever we put over here. But since we are not adding the ingredient, we haven't written on the ingredient yet, um, the add ingredient button, all it does is just adds a, an empty string to the end of the array, which um, for us is good, because now what we can do is we can generate the ingredients input based on uh, the recipe dot ingredients list. So whenever you click on a button, you add another item to the list. So it will map that item. And we can grab the both the ingredient and the index of that ingredient, and then just return over here, we'll actually not even use um, curly braces, let's just use um, parentheses like this. And we can just return an input for each of those ingredients. Now the input will have first a key, we have to add a key since this is, uh, we're mapping through a list, then we can put a type of text. And we add a name because we have to add a name, right, it will be ingredient has to match the, the state, then we put a value and the value for this will be equal to the ingredients, uh, the ingredient that we are um, this getting from the array. And finally, we're going to give an on change. Now the on change will be a little bit different because we need to know which ingredient we want to change, right? which ingredient we want to add. And also we need to know the value of what you're writing on the input. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this function over here event, and passing another function called um, handle ingredient change, let's call it that way. So we're basically creating another version of this handle change, but specifically just for the ingredient, because it will be a little bit different. So let's call it handle ingredient change, and pass it in over here. And we're gonna we're gonna need both things, we're gonna need both the event for this function and the index of where this recipe is, because now what we can do is we can come over here to the handle ingredient change, we can get just the value, that's all we need technically, because we already have what we want, uh, we can get it from the target, then we can create a kind of like a, a replica of our ingre current ingredient list. So we'll call it uh, ingredients like this is equal to recipe dot ingredients. We're just making a copy of it. But this copy, we're going to change um, the element in the index equal to index, the one we're getting from this uh, function, right, we're passing it in, and we're changing it equal to the value of the event. So th that's why we keep track of the index because we already added it to the array. And adding it to the array is done in the add ingredient uh, function. But now we just need to change the value of that specific ingredient. So that's how we do it. And to set the recipe, we don't set it uh, like we we're setting it before. All we do is we just set the recipe to be equal to the same recipe. But now we have the ingredients equal to the field ingredients um, equal to the new ingredients array with the changed index over here. Now again, since JavaScript has a shorthand notation, notation, we just we just have to put it like this. But now this seems to or should be working, we can actually check to see if it's working. I'll console log over here the the recipe, not even over here, I'll console log like below. So it keeps console logging so we can see. So I'll open our inspect element over here. Let's go to our console. Uh, it seems that there's a bunch of weird errors that I'm not Oh, okay, they went away. So we have over here, initially our, in our recipe, right? But if I type over here, lasagna, you see that now, the name field is set to be lasagna, if I put some instructions, you'll see that obviously, now we have that, those instructions, I'll put a URL, it seems to be working as well. 
I will change this to 10. And it seems to be working as well. The final thing is the ingredients list. Now let's check to see if I click on this button, we should see an input appearing over here. And it seems to appear, but it seems to disappear after we click on it, which is weird. Now I guess I understand why this is happening. Uh, I just realized we created the button, but um, since there, this is the only button inside of this form, the form automatically assumes that this button is being used to submit the form. So a way we can differentiate this button inside of the form from a submit button is by actually giving it a type of button. And then we can create the button for submit, which we haven't done yet, but we will need eventually, uh, we can put it over here and change the type to submit. And obviously I'll remove this because this is not how the button will look like. And I'll change this text to create recipe. Now let's take a look, you'll see we now have the button over here, nothing happens when I click on it other than submitting the form. Um, but we'll handle that later. Uh, what we want is to see if I click on this button, will it add the ingredients and it seems to be adding the ingredients, you'll see that the ingredients list now has four elements, but they're all empty strings, which makes sense, because that's what we added over here as the functionality. But if I were to type, for example, on the first one, if I wanted to add it, uh, an ingredient six pounds of ribeye steak, right? Now, it changed the value of the first ingredient to that. If I change this one to something else, you'll see it is uh, accordingly changing the ingredients, which is pretty good. So our inputs and our form seems to be working perfectly. So what do we do now? Well, now it's the best part. It's where we send this data to our API. So what we want to do is I want to delete this console log and I want to create a on submit function. So const on submit. And this function will be used to submit our form. Uh, we want the event so that we can prevent default and not have our, our form, um, our page refreshing every time we click on the submit button. So we'll say event dot prevent default. And then we want to try catch, right, because we're, we're going to do some API requests over here, and do the same thing we've been doing so far. So console dot error, error. And now what we want is to pass this on submit into our form. So we'll put on submit. And we'll pass in the on submit. Perfect. Now, what do we want? Well, we want to send this data. So we're going to say await, and we want to make a post request to our recipes route. So you're going to say axios post. And I think we don't have axios imported over here. So let's import axios from axios. And we want to make a post request to the URL that we have set over here. Yeah, I think Yeah, this is the I think this is the correct URL. So let's put this over here. And then we need to pass in the recipe, right? But how do we pass in the recipe? Well, the recipe is an object containing all of the data that we want to send. So we can technically just put it over here, just like this. And if we go down and alert a message saying recipe created, something like this recipe created, we can now check to see um, if everything seems to be working. So uh, let's see how many recipes we have right now. So we have um, only one recipe, but let's add another one. Okay, as you can see, I just added some information, I didn't show it to you guys, because it would get a little bit boring. Uh, I just added a very simple recipe for shepherd's pie. I don't even think it's right, because I got bored after copying the data. And I just literally put shepherds and pie over here. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. It's just an example. Let's try to create the recipe. Let's open this up, go to our console, let's see if any errors will appear. And also, check this out. When I click on the button create recipe, we should see it over here. So when I click on it, we got this alert, which means that on the try catch, the try prevailed and it didn't catch any errors. But let's check to see if the data is here. When I click find, um, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be here for some reason. But there was also not no errors, which is weird. So let's check our network request. Let's click again. Hmm. That's weird. Uh, let's look at this to see what's happening. So we say, recipe.created. Oh, we can check actually in our server to see if there's any errors. Huh? There seems to be no errors when I click create recipe, which is interesting. Oh, I, I forgot to remove the third party requests over here. Let's check to see what's happening. So I am sending the data, but it's giving us an error. Oh, I'm aware of what the error is. And this is totally my fault. We forgot to add the 
the user owner ID as part of the of what we're sending to the front end, right? So over here, we're just sending the recipe, but we're not sending the 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 like the user who is creating the recipe, we're not sending their ID. So as of right now, I just put zero over here, which obviously doesn't work because and that's why it's not working. But um, the way we're going to do this is if you recall, we saved our, our actual user ID in our local storage. So if I go to to um, application, go to our local storage. Oh, I'm not logged in. I'm going to try to log in. Uh, I'm going to use Jack DR account. And I'm going to put I think it was password. I think that's their password. Yeah, it seems to be so now we should have our user ID in our application in our local storage, right? So I'm going to create a hook. So I'm going to make a custom hook that is going to um, return back this user ID whenever I wanted to. Now, why am I making a, a, a custom hook? Because it is best practices, in my opinion, I like making hooks for stuff like this. And I, I think it's a good idea to show you guys um, how to create a simple hook um, that you can reuse whenever you want to get your the ID, for example. So let's call this hook use get user ID. So we're going to create this file. And the hook is going to be really simple. So export const use get user ID. All the hook does is it just returns back. All it returns back is the window dot local storage dot get item. And we pass in the user ID. I believe this is how we we wrote user ID over here. Uh, yeah, so this is all the hook is doing, but we don't have to rewrite this whole thing. All we do is we come over here to create recipe, for example, we import, um, we import the use get user ID. And we just this structure or actually just get the user ID like this. Now you might say, Oh, isn't this more lines of code than just uh, writing this every time you want it? Yes, of course it is. But the thing is, if I want the user ID in multiple parts of my app, uh, now I just have to, to call the user ID variable instead of having to rewrite all of this. Obviously, I could also just create that variable every single time. But trust me, I'm just doing this because um, I wanted to set up an example of how hooks can be useful. Um, and how you would create a little hook. So that's why I included in this in this video. But now I can just use this user ID whenever I want to. And I want to over here, I want to use it inside of our user owner like this. I'll just put it over here. Now, if we try to create a recipe, I have to rewrite all of that. But <laughs> I'll be back in a second when I'm done and it should be working. Okay, so as you can see, I put in the information, I got bored this time. So I didn't even put in everything. But let's check to see um, if everything will work perfectly. So no shepherd's pie inside of our database. Let's create a recipe. We got this command over here. So let's check to see if it's here. And yes, it is. Thank God. So we have we have over here. Um, the shepherd's pie recipe created. So we successfully added this functionality to our front end. Now, when you create a recipe, I technically want to redirect to the home page. So uh, I'm gonna uh, use the use navigate hook again, uh, just to navigate to the to the uh, home page. So I'm gonna say const navigate equals to use navigate. And we have to import that over here at the top import use navigate from react router dom. And then when we submit right after this, I want to navigate to the home page. Now, what we want to do is we want to add the functionality to display all of our recipes created inside of our home page. So that's going to be pretty simple and quick, because technically, we already have a lot of the code. And um, we've done a lot so far. So um, it should be pretty similar to what we've been doing. So it won't take a lot of time. So for the home page, we'll just come over here. <laughs> the home component seems really empty and sad right now. But we're going to make it look better. We're going to come over here at the top, we're going to import the use take hook from react from react um, use state and we're going to um, create over here the state called recipes and set recipes. Now this the state will be used to keep track of all the recipes uh, that are exist in our database. So to do that, we have to get those recipes. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use a use effect. 
A use effect is a cook that will be called whenever the component is rendered. So uh, whenever when you enter on the web page, um, on the home page, for example, this function will be called. Now, we want to have asynchronous stuff inside of here, right? So we can't just make this function in the use effect async. This is actually against what React allows us to. So what we do is whenever we want to do have some async functionality inside of a use effect, we just create a function that is async inside of the, the use effect and just call it right after, right? So I'm going to create this fetch recipe function that is going to be async and right after this, I'm just going to call this function, right? So in the fetch recipe function, I want to try catch, I'm even going to just copy uh, this over here. So we don't waste a lot of time, I'm just going to paste it over here. And what we want this time is we actually want to keep track of what we're try catching or what we're getting back from our request, because um, we want to set our recipes to be equal to that. So we need to import axios as well. Um, from Axios. And now I want to make this into a get request. And this should be working. This should be uh, how it is. Uh, we just have a get request with this URL, if you recall, just like this. And um, the response now is useful because all we have to do is we just set the recipes, uh, which I just realized I wrote it wrong. <laughs> I'll just set the recipes equal to the response dot data and response dot data should return back the list of recipes. Now I don't want to alert anything and I don't want to navigate after this. Um, this should work. As of right now, let's just console log the recipe, the response dot data. So we see if we're getting the correct data. Um, and we should let's see. Yeah, we're getting an array with two recipes. So that request seems to be working. But what we do is we actually just want to um, keep track of this recipes array. And instead of our return statement over here, we're going to put a uh, first an h2 tag saying recipes, just like this. And then we want to make a list, right, a list with all of the recipes being displayed. So we're going to add a ul to start an unordered list. And inside of this list, we're going to map through the recipes state. And for each recipe that is in that array, we want to um, make a li, right. And then this li will have a, a key, right. And we want to set the key equal to um, the recipe dot underscore ID. The reason why we want to do it this way is just because we know this will be unique. So it won't cause any problems. Um, then we want to set the div over here and put inside of the div another h2 tag. Actually, since this we're going to be using h2 tags over here, maybe this will be better as an h1 tag. So I'm changing this. And the h2 tag will just display first the name of the recipe. So for each recipe we will display their name, then we want to close this div, come over here and open another div. Now this div will be for the instructions. So we'll give it even a class name because I think I added some CSS um, for this as well. And inside of here, we'll put a p tag that will just display the instructions for this uh, recipe. Then we come over here, we add the image, right? The, so the image from the recipe will just set the source equal to the uh, recipe dot image URL. And then we also need to set an, an alt, right? In case the image doesn't load, we'll just set it equal to the recipe dot name. And then below this, finally, we just put the cooking time. So I'll say cooking time equals to recipe dot cooking time. And we need to specify that this is in minutes. So I'll just correct this like this and put in minutes like this. Now I'm going to save this and let's check to see how it looks. Uh, it looks pretty good, right? It looks it, sh demonstra it shows exactly what we wanted. It shows the, the title, the instruction and the image and the cooking time. Now, there's one thing that we have to do left with this. Obviously, there's, <laughs> it seems too easy, right? This is all we did for this page. But no, technically, we have the functionality to save a recipe, right? And that's interesting, because when you save a recipe, um, it should actually store in the users array, it should add into the users array, a new field called save recipes and add the recipes ID that you saved into that array. But how are we going to do that? Well, the way I did it and the way I rec recommend doing is whenever you have a recipe like this, there should be a button over here where you can click to save the recipe. So 
I'm going to add that button right now. And I want to add it right below the recipe name. So or right next to it. So I'm going to add a button, which is going to be called um, probably something like save over here to save the recipe. And when you click on this button, we're going to put an on click over here and call the function um, save recipe. But it's important that when we call this function, we pass in the ID of this recipe so we can send it to the backend, right? We need that. So that's why we're doing this because now in this in this function, we're going to pass in the recipe ID. Now we can go up over here and create this function. Because this part is a little bit more complicated, the whole saving recipe thing. So I want to go slowly. So I'm just going to create this function. And obviously, it will be async. So I'm going to make this async like this. And we need the ID over here. Now, this function, um, this part of the function won't actually be that complicated, we'll just copy the try catch over here, paste it. And all we want is just a response, right? Because when what we get back from the saved recipes API, if we look back what we created, right, we'll see that in the in the request to save a recipe, it's a put request. And we receive back the list, the updated list of, of, of saved recipes for this user. So, uh, we can make a put request to the recipes API. And when we console this, console log this, we should see the list of um, of saved recipes. Let's test this out. Let's come over here. Oh, I forgot to pass the recipe ID as uh, and the user ID, we need to pass both things, right? The user ID and the recipe ID into the body. So I'm going to pass in the recipe ID and the user ID just like this. Now let's check this out. Uh, oh, user ID is not defined. Oh, I need to call the the use get user ID hook uh, from dot slash, I need to go back twice, hooks slash user get use get user ID, then I'll just get the user ID. Just like this. And now it should be working. So let's test this out. If I click on save for the stake, um, if you go to users over here, obviously, there's, there's no user ID over here. So there's no saved recipes over here. When I click on this, I actually think it will give us an error, but uh, maybe not. Let's see the data. Actually, it seems to have worked. Let's update this. Yeah, it worked. So we now have um, the recipe ID for this specific for the recipe that we saved the steak one over here. Now let's refresh this and try to save the shepherd's pie. So when I click on this, now not only should we receive back an array with a shepherd's pie, but also the steak that we saved previously. And that's exactly what happens. And if I refresh this, you see the shepherd's pie is here again. Now, the interesting thing is I, I can save this again, which is not a functionality I want to allow the front end to be able to to do. Obviously, in the back end, I could have uh, made it so that you can't repeat stuff that you're saved, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, it won't change anything. Because all we want to know over here is technically which recipes are saved or not. So I do want to create a state over here, which is going to keep track of all of our saved recipes, because we want to fetch the ID of those recipes to um, be able to determine which ones are saved or not. So I'm going to create a, a state called saved recipes and set saved recipes. Then I want to inside of our use effect create another function called fetch saved recipes, just like this. Now for this one, uh, the API request we want to make is not for this get request over here, but rather for this one over here. So we're going to get this and put it right over here. Now to get request just like before, and instead of setting the recipes, we're going to set the saved recipes. But actually, I just want to see something I want to actually just console uh, log the response dot data. So we look a little bit to see if it's if it's working and to see if it's if we're getting the correct data. Also, we need to pass in the the user ID, I remember, right, we get the user ID in this request. So we need to pass in through our body. So I'm just going to put over here, the user ID, just like this. So let's test this out, I'm going to inspect element, uh, refresh the page and nothing appears. I guess it's because I never called <laughs> the fetch saved recipes function. But now it should show something, but it doesn't seem to be showing anything. Although we are logged in. Let's take a look at the request. Let's look at the network request. So IDs, 
what are we sending to them? So hmm, let's look at our backend. Um, is there anything that it we're doing wrong over here? Hmm, it doesn't seem like it as well. Oh, guys, I'm stupid. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I just realized what the error was. But keep in mind, I like when I commit errors in my videos. I've said this a lot in the past. It helps to show you guys how to fix errors, how to debug. And also, uh, it shows that I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I haven't like finished everything. Uh, I'm trying to come up with it at the spot as well. So you guys can kind of get a good representation of how coding actually is. So uh, obviously, you can send data, body data to get requests. Anyone caught this before? Uh, it's just a stupid mistake. But uh, with get requests, what we can do is actually send the data through the params. So we're not going to get this through our body. We're actually going to get it from uh, a param over here. So user ID is how we're going to you to send the data. And to get date, uh, this user ID from the params, instead of re saying rack.body, we're going to say rack.params. And then over here, instead of making a request, sending a body like that, we'll just pass in over here, um, a variable equal to the user ID. But to send a variable, we have to make this string into backticks and then put in the money sign and curly braces and just pass in the user ID. I'm pretty sure this will work now. Let's check our console, refresh the page. Oh, it actually didn't break. It did correctly send it back. I don't know what happened. So uh, you see it is sending back the saved recipes. So everything seems to be working perfectly. And that was indeed the error. So now that we're getting back the saved recipes, what we want to do is we want to just set the saved recipes to be equal to response dot data. Um, dot. Yes, saved recipes. So dot saved recipes. And I'm going to delete this console log. And now we're keeping track of the saved recipes, which is pretty good. Now, how do we know if a specific recipe has been saved by the current user? Well, we're keeping track of the state, which tells us which recipes were saved by the user. So all we have to do, for example, is if I want to make if I want to, I don't know, write the word uh, saved, whenever this specific recipe um, was already saved, right? All I have to do is I just have to put a conditional over here a condition and say that Oh, okay, if the saved recipes array includes the index or the ID for this specific recipe, then um, display this and you'll see that this works because it was already saved. But if I were to create another recipe over here, which I'm going to do right now, but not show you guys. So this is the recipe I'm creating, I'm going to click on create recipe, it will create it, you see that all of them says already saved, but the new recipe that I just created doesn't say already saved because I never saved it, I could test it by clicking on this button. And I'm pretty sure if I refresh it right now, it will say already saved. Now it should save it automatically. But we haven't finished that up uh, yet. So uh, let's continue coding it. But you see all the functionality seems to be working. Now, we should we don't want to just show already saved like this, we actually want to show a button, right? We want to actually use the button. And whenever you already saved the recipe, you want to disable the button, this save button over here. So the way we're going to do that is this whole includes functionality, we can actually create a function over here, which is going to be used whenever we want to know if a recipe was already is, is already saved by the user. So let's create this function called is recipe saved. And all this function wants is the ID of the recipe. And it will return back a boolean saying if it's saved or not, I don't want to be checking if it includes every single time, I just want to call this function. So inside of the button over here, we want to disable this button, if if the is recipe saved is equal to true. So we're going to set the recipe dot underline ID over here. And you'll see that now, for all of the buttons, it will be disabled and we can't click them. Now, this seems pretty good, right? But it still says save. So let's change the text. Uh, if it's been saved, it should say saved. Uh, if not, it shouldn't. So we can actually just add this functionality over here. Um, and say that if is recipe saved is equal to true, then we want to say saved. But if not, we want to say safe. And you'll see that now all of them changed to saved. But also we'll see that in the 
save recipe function over here. If you want that functionality to whenever you add a new recipe and uh, whenever you save a recipe um, like this, the button and all the UI will change automatically instead, instead of having to refresh the page. All you have to do is just set the recipe, uh, the saved recipes to be equal to the response dot data dot saved recipes when we save a recipe. So if you recall, we did send back the updated list of saved recipes when we save a recipe, uh, I believe, let's check it out. Uh, yeah, we return back the saved recipe. So uh, if we just set it like this, it should work perfectly. And now this entire section over here seems to be working perfectly. Um, so now all we have to do is just uh, create the saved recipes section. And at the end, we're going to add all of the stuff related to authenticating the user when they make a request. It's just the final thing we're going to use the token that we created in the beginning to fix all of our endpoints. But for now, let's just work on saving, uh, creating the saved recipes page. So this page will actually be very similar to the home page. So similar that I'm actually going to copy all of this code and just paste it over here. Now I'm going to change some stuff like I'm going to call this saved recipe or saved recipes like this. And um, what I want is I don't need to create a state called saved recipes, because technically, we're in the saved recipes page. So the state, the state recipes should assume it is already saved recipes, right? We also want, uh, we want the same thing over here, the use effect, because we want to whenever you go into this page to automatically show the recipes. But again, we don't need to have a fetch recipe and a fetch saved recipes, we just need the fetch saved recipe, or just call it fetched recipes as well. I don't think it matters. Actually, let's call this saved recipes still just to maintain consistency. Um, like this. Now, this whole thing should be similar. But the difference is we don't need the IDs anymore, we actually need the entire recipe. So we're going to pass in just like this. And um, let's see what's giving errors. Oh, okay, we don't need the save recipe function. Also, we don't need the is recipe saved because that's that doesn't matter all the recipes that are going to be displayed in, in this page are already saved or assumed to be saved. Now this thing over here, let's change this, the text to saved recipes. And when we return this, we don't want to have the button to save because again, you don't want to save recipes that you already saved. Um, the rest, I think should be fine. I don't think it matters to put any of anything else. Let's check what the error is. It says recipes. Oh, because we need to change this to saved recipes. You'll see now it seems to be working. It is not yet displaying the saved recipes because remember, we made the mistake in the in the get recipes ID uh, route where we were passing in the body. And I believe we did the same thing over here, we can't pass a body um, to a get request. So uh, we're going to do the same thing we did over here, where we pass in the user ID through the params. So we're just going to change this to params. And now um, what we do is we come back here, this should be working. And I guess this should be working too, right? Yeah, it, it is working. <laughs> it's showing all the saved recipes inside of this um, page. But the difference is that you guys are not actually seeing if it's working or not, because all of our recipes have been saved. So what I want to do is instead of creating a new recipe, I'm actually going to try to change this, I'm going to delete uh, the lasagna, actually, I'll delete the steak and not save the steak. Um, so you can delete it directly like this. We'll go back to the home page, you'll see that the steak is not saved anymore. But the shepherd's pie and the lasagna are saved. So if I go to save recipes, we don't see the steak anymore, we only see the lasagna and the shepherd's pie, meaning that our whole functionality is working, which is perfect. Now that's great. We're pretty much done with a lot of the functionality inside of our project. Now really, the last few things we want to do is being able to use our token, which we created in our backend. Um, to validate um, every request. So whenever we, we make a API request, right, either it be for the recipes or for the users, actually, just for the recipes, in this case, whenever we make any of these API requests, if it is an important request that you have to be logged in to make, we want to really authenticate the token that you have inside of this request. So the way we do this, uh, usually in Node.js, at least with a, a simple, a very simple version of this is by creating what is known as a middleware, which is a function that will run before each request. And that function will verify if your token you're sending from the front end matches the token that you should be sending. So inside of our users um, thing over here, let's create a middleware, we'll do it even after the the router uh, export over here. So let's just export a const called and the middleware will be called verify 
token. And for middlewares in Express, you can have access to the REC, the RES, and to this function called next, uh, which will be used to authorize um, the, the request to continue. Now, if you're not familiar with middlewares, I truly think you should watch one of my videos on it. I have a full video just on uh, Express middlewares. Um, and I'll just skim through a little bit over here. But I would recommend watching a full on video on that. So in this middleware, what we're going to do is we're going to first um, assume that we're going to send our token our JWT through the headers, and through a header called authorization. So let's uh, grab that token like this. And set it equal to rec dot headers dot authorization. So in the front end, we have to send a header with the authorization field, our key. And then we're going to check, okay, if any token was sent, then we want to verify if this token makes sense. So we're going to verify with the token with the same secret that we used over here. So this has to match this. And then what we do is we'll have a callback function, which will give us any errors in case there's any errors. And we're going to check, okay, if there's any errors, we want to um, probably return uh, res dot send status, we want to send a status uh, saying that this didn't work. So we want to send a 403 status, just that to if you're familiar, not familiar with status codes, I would recommend looking at them, but uh, we're just telling ourselves that we're not authorized, this user is not authorized. And right after this, we'll call next because if the verification was done, and there was no errors, then we should allow the user to continue with their request. Now, if there's no token, that means we don't even have a token to verify meaning that the user obviously is not verified. So um, we're going to send back a status, and we're probably going to send a 401 over here. So now we have this middleware that we want to run before every important API request that requires us to um, be authenticated. Now, what are those? Well, the create recipe one is it is one right because we want to only allow um, uh, people who are actual users to create a recipe. So we'll import this at the top, the verify token and pass it in right before the callback function in the route. Then we also want to do this for the uh, for the save recipe one probably. And the other ones, I don't think it matters because I'm going to actually prohibit the ability to go to the save recipe page, unless you are logged in. So I don't think that will matter that much. But if you guys want to do it anyways, I think you guys should like it, it's best practices to it makes your project more secure, you're always verifying stuff. But to simplify everything, I'm just gonna um, do it for the create recipe and the save recipe. So since I put this middleware over here, this means that this request will never work anymore. Like I won't be able to save this thing anymore. Because you'll see that when I try to save this, I'm not currently sending anything through the headers, I haven't, I've done the implementation on the back end, but I haven't done anything in the front end that will allow ourselves to send the token. So if I click on this, we should get back a request failed with status code 401. Why did we get a 401? Because over here, in our verified token, if we don't send a token from the front end, we're sending back a 401. If the token is wrong, we send back a 403. So let's test sending a wrong token. If I come over here, and I go to the save recipe thing, we want to send it through the headers, right? So let's uh, to send something through the headers in Axios, all you do is you just create this object over here, pass in the headers. And instead of the headers, we need to pass in an authorization um, field, right? Because that's what we assumed we were going to call it. Now, let's piss in a fake one, just a random strings of letters, right? And let's test to see what's going to happen. We should get back a 403 code because it has a token, right? It has a token, but it's not verifiable. Now, how do we send in the token that we want to be verified? Well, inside of here, we need to grab our cookies, just like we were doing um, in our authentication thing, we'll grab the use cookie hook. And we'll grab the we'll actually destructure the cookies like this. Um, just like this. And we don't need the set cookies thing, we need the just the cookies. So we pass in the cookies inside of here, by saying cookies dot access token. And now, if everything seems right, we should be able to save this thing. And we are able to because we are sending the correct token to be verified. So we just set up correctly authentication and authorization inside of our project. Um, 
now we just have to do it for the for the create recipe one as well. Uh, but it's pretty much the same thing. So I don't think a lot of explanation will be needed for that. We just come to create recipe. Um, after the, the body, we send the headers, and we do need to have access to the cookies. So I'll just copy this whole logic of, of importing the use cookie over here at the top, and getting the cookies from this. And I think now it should be working for the create recipe one as well. So this is pretty much it for the code. All we can do now is like I said, I'm going to prohibit ourselves from seeing the saved recipes field, but that's pretty simple. All we do is we go to our auth over here. And we just extend our actually, it's not in the auth, it's in the nav bar. Uh, we just extend our check for if the if the user is logged in. And if they are logged in, we want to display the saved recipes thing, only if they're logged in. So we'll put the saved recipes over here. We're going to put a fragment in order to be able to have uh, elements without a parent. And now you'll see that this appears. But if I log out, it doesn't appear anymore. So Oh, it's breaking the home page. It's breaking because we're trying to check for users who, who are not since we're not logged in, we're trying to check for their saved recipes. So a way to, ch to actually prevent all of that from happening is we can actually just um, just allow the the, the fetch re re saved recipes thing over here. If uh, cookies dot access token is true, if not, then we don't want to make the request and you see it works, right? <laughs> That's good. I think it will break if I click saved. Actually, it won't. But oh, yeah, it won't because it make, makes sense. So everything seems to be working. Now, all we have to do is be able to deploy this to Hostinger, which is one of the most important parts of the video. Okay, everyone. So let's start the process of deployment. So we just went into the H panel from Hostinger, like I showed you guys in the beginning of the video. And from here, we can basically handle everything that we need. So the first thing we need to do is claim our free domain with the account that um, you guys should have created and, and purchased uh, in the beginning of the video. So I'm going to click on claim domain. And I'm going to put a domain name. So uh, I you should choose whatever makes sense for you, you can even use this for another website if you're interested in because you got the domain. So you can claim whatever domain you want to. But um, I'm going to make one associated to this. So I'm going to create, I'm going to call it Pedro tech recipes. I doubt that there's already a domain like that. So I'm going to put a dot com because it, it looks better Pedro tech recipes dot com, I'm going to check the availability. And as you can see, there it is available because who else would have <laughs> bought this domain. But you can see that instead of being $14 a year, we're actually paying nothing because it comes with the plan. So now we're going to click on claim domain. And um, we should see our domain being um, claimed. So as you can see, we can choose the domain, uh, the profile of whoever owns this domain, I already have a profile, I'm obviously not showing to you guys because it shows my address and stuff. Uh, but if you don't, you can just click on add new profile as well. So I'm going to choose the one that I already have and click on finish registration, it's going to start uh, registering and you can see, it's pretty much done. The only thing that you need now is to verify your domain. So I'm gonna go to my email, um, verify this domain through my email and be back in a second. Okay, I just verified on my email. If I refresh this, it should be working. Yeah, it seems that it was verified. And this should update to say it was verified as well. Now that this is done, we're going to go back to our home page over here. And we're going to click on the setup for premium web hosting. When I click on this, uh, it's going to open this up, we're going to click on start now. Now you see there's two options. One of them is to transfer and migrate an existing website to Hostinger. This is in the case you're already hosting it somewhere else, for example, and you want to now host with Hostinger. Now the create new website is Hostinger actually gives you a really nice like system for you to build your website without code by using something like WordPress. Um, however, we're not going to be doing that we already have a website. So I'm going to click on skip and create an empty website. Then it's going to ask us to choose a domain or use an existing domain that we've pr purchased outside of Hostinger. But we already have a domain, we have pagelotechrecipes.com. So I'm going to click on that, and then click on select. Now it's going to ask for a server location, they have a bunch of servers out there. I'm going to choose the South America one because it's closer to where I am right now. Um, however, it doesn't really matter, like, uh, just choose the one that is closest to you, but it will pretty much work everywhere. Uh, 
I'm not actually in South America right now, but it works perfectly fine. Um, and all of the ones that I've deployed in the past worked continuously worked pretty well, even though I'm not in this specific continent. So then I'm going to click on finish setup. And it should pretty much be done. Now it seems to be done. We're going to click on view website. Now it's going to open up <laughs> our website with our domain. However, uh, we don't uh, currently de we didn't deploy anything yet. So obviously, it doesn't make sense. Then we're going to click on manage website. And over here is where we're going to actually insert our files. So we click on file manager over here. And this will redirect us to a page where we can actually just drag and drop files that we need to deploy. So we have over here our public.html folder. What this is asking for is basically the public.html folder that we have over here inside of our app, right? But for that, we do need to run my uh, create a build version of my uh, project, right? And I'm talking about the front end only just the client. So to do that, I'm going to go into my client folder over here, I'm going to kill the terminal that was running it and I'm going to run yarn run build. It's going to create an optimized production build. It's going to be over here, as you can see, and that's what we're going to put inside of our um, file manager. So here in our file manager, inside of the public.html folder, I'm going to we have this default.php file over here, which we we don't actually need this is what only the only thing that this does is um, it's currently just demonstrating this page over here. So it, that's why it's, it's here. But if we actually delete it, um, it will remove whatever creates this I don't know if it's automatically, but um, yeah, it removed whatever was there, the, the only piece of code that was there. So now what we do is we put our files inside of this folder. So we just come over here, we open this folder, I don't know, review it in finder, you'll see that this over here is what appears. And now that we are in the client folder, we just open the build folder. And we copy all of this stuff and just drag and drop over here. You should see that it is uploading the files and they go pretty fast as you can see. Now that they're here, it's pretty much done. What we do is we literally just refresh this page. And we should see the front end of our app appearing over here. Now we can see all of our data being displayed, as you can see, and it's all being hosted, our front end is all being hosted in this URL over here, with a secure connection, meaning that we have an SSL certificate that is valid. Um, and you can see everything is working out perfectly, right, we can create a recipe, we can log in if we wanted to, we can do all of that kind of stuff. Now, one thing I want to mention to you guys is that the reason why we're seeing all the data being served is because we're running um, our project and our backend over here. So we have our backend running, as you can see. Now, if you want to run this and have your data being served, um, you can deploy the backend um, in a variety of ways, you can deploy it to a VPS, for example, and serve it using hosting or they have this, um, this capability. And I would recommend doing this as well. However, I'm not going to show it in this video, because it would add a lot of time to this video. And I think just showing you guys how to deploy the front end and how to build the application is enough for now, because because it's already a lot of stuff for you guys to to like have to understand and learn. So if you guys are interested in learning how to deploy um, the back end of this app to a VPS, I can definitely make a video on that as well. Again, thank you Hostinger for sponsoring this video. This is the third video that Hostinger has sponsored for me. And it is because I love the platform and I've been using a lot of it. And all of you guys in the previous videos have told me that you guys liked it as well. So I really appreciate them supporting the channel. Uh, you guys should check them out in the description, there will be a link you guys can get a discount completely like I showed in the beginning. And yeah, that's that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment what you want to see next. Subscribe because I'm posting every single week and I would massively appreciate it. And I'll see you guys next time.